Thank you everyone that joined us during the lunch networking session uh, with Dr. James Till. I would like to thank Dr. James Till again for his time to allow our attendees a very, very informative and fascinating networking opportunity. We will now transition into the case competitions. Just a reminder that due to unexpected circumstances, we will be canceling the bioethics competition. We will just have the research competition right here in the research hall. Judges, for the research case competition, we will now promote you to panelists for video and audio sharing. So I would like to first introduce the judges for the research case competition. Dr. Emily Gilbert is a regenerative neurobiologist and a current postdoctoral fellow in the Morshid lab at the Donnelly Center for Cellular and Biomolecular Research. She completed her graduate training in biomedical sciences at the University of Guelph. In 2017, Dr. Emily, Dr. Emily Gilbert began her po postdoctoral training at the University of Toronto. Her current work aims to enhance the response of resident neural stem and progenitor cells and improve the structural and functional recovery following a range of injuries within the central nervous system, including the spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis. Gurdeep Singh is a final year PhD candidate in Prof. Jennifer Mitchell's lab at the Cell and Systems Biology, Biology Department at the University of Toronto. He is also enrolled in the collaborative graduate program in genome biology and bioinformatics. His work in Mitchell Lab focuses on using computational experimental genomics and molecular biology approaches to better understand the mammalian regulatory genome and enhancer sequence code in the stem cells and other tissues. Dr. Karen Dewar is a senior director of genomic programs at Genome Canada, where she is responsible for Genome Canada's portfolio of large scale genomic programs, as well as genomic application partnership program or GAP. Karen has a PhD um, in biological psychiatry from the University of Saskatchewan and also spent a number of years in the Academia of University of Manitoba and the University of Montreal. So the theme for the research case competition is discussing the superior stem cell subtype between the induced pluripotent stem cells or embryonic stem cells. So the induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs are cells that have been reprogrammed and induced from differentiated human cells. Um, however, the embryonic stem cells, or ESCs, are stem cells derived from the undifferentiated inner mast cells of the human embryo. So I would also like to remind the competitors and the judges on how the competition will be run today. So we have a total of four teams that will be presenting their proposals. Each team will get a maximum of five minutes for their presentations with a two minute overtime with penalty. After the presentation, five minutes will be given to the judges to ask the team any questions. Please give a two sentence introduction to, um, this is a reminder to the um, competitors that please give a two sentence introduction about yourselves before starting your presentations. Siu, um, who will be joining me, um, he will be holding up a one finger um, for a one minute left until the five minute mark. And unfortunately, I would have to cut the competitors off at the seven minutes. So the first team can um, get prepared for their um, for the presentations by sharing their slides. And um, if you can please promote the first team. We will approximately begin the, the presentation for the first team at 1240. If the team is ready, you guys can start your introductions by um, introducing yourselves. And um, if you guys can get ready for your slides and present them.
Um, yeah, so I'll go first. Uh, my name is Kelly Jin. I am a junior at Alexander McKenzie High School in uh, Richmond Hill. Hi, I'm Arabella Stommer, and I'm a junior at White Oak Secondary School. My name is Hassan Naim, and I'm a junior at White Oak Secondary School as well. My name is Ahmed Siraj, and I'm also a junior at White Oak Secondary School. that's all of us. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think you guys are ready for your presentations. So um, I'd, we can possibly just start it now. Um, we're gonna time you and Siwu will be holding up a one finger for your um, four minute that you guys spent for your research. So um, we will start timing you um, now and you guys can start your presentations. Thank you. So um, our proposal dives into the usage of embryonic stem cells for the treatment of psoriasis. So what exactly is psoriasis? Psoriasis is an inflammatory autoimmune disease characterized by the overproliferation of keratinocytes. Now this leads to the formation of scaly and itchy white clumps of skin, which can be found throughout the body. So we chose psoriasis because it affects two to 3% of the global population, with 60% of psoriatic patients reporting the disease to be a major inhibitor to their everyday lives. And we found that through the use of mesenchymal stem cells, which have a wide range of tested therapeutic properties for the treatment of psoriasis, mainly including the fact that they are immunosuppressants, meaning they inhibit the response of immune cells. They're anti-inflammatory, meaning they reduce the swelling of the epidermis, and they can differentiate into adipose tissue amongst other dermal tissues, which increase overall skin health. So we know that both ESCs and iPSCs can be induced into MSCs, but the question is, which type is more appropriate? Now we decide whether ESCs or iPSCs are appropriate to use as MSC differentiation platforms. Starting with tumorigenicity, MSCs derived from ESCs exhibited a much lower risk of teratoma formation when compared to iPSC derived MSCs, which displayed a significantly higher risk of tumor formation. Moving on to genetic risks, ESCs exhibit few genetic risks as their genetic material varies from the adult tissue. However, certain iPSC programming protocols involve oncogenic expression, histone alteration, and gene deregulation which increases mutagenic potential and thus in increases the risk of harm to the patient. Lastly, iPSCs are much harder to create and extract due to the fact that multiple reprogramming processes are required. ESCs are much simpler to isolate and extract because they do not require cell co-culturing, transfection, or sorting. So overall, we have decided to use ESCs as a derivation platform for MSCs, primarily to ensure patient safety. iPSCs pose too many risks to the safety of future human trial groups and are harder to derive. Moving on to our research aims, we will go over our goals and the purpose of the investigation. We have two specific aims we would like to touch on. Our first goal is to de determine the treatment potential of HESC-derived MSCs for psoriasis. Our second aim is to further the understanding of ESC therapy for tissue regeneration and immune disorders. Next is our hypothesis, outlining our experiment predictions, which states that if HESC-derived MSCs are transplanted into a sample of 45 lab mice afflicted with plaque psoriasis, then their psoriatic lesions will gradually decrease at the point of complete absence because MSCs exhibit immunomodulating, adipocyte generating, and anti-inflammatory properties that all have a basis in treating different aspects of the disease. Um, sorry, our members screen appears to crash. Now we're going to talk about the experimental design of our proposal. We plan to first extract the ESCs from human embryos before inducing them into MSCs. Afterwards, we would induce psoriasis into a trial group of mice before injecting them with HESC-derived MSCs. The participants in the trial are the 45 mice we plan to use as a test group, in which there are three groups of 15 for the three different number of injections. Each trial will be done with five mice, and there will be three trials done for each group. For variables, our independent variable is the number of MSC injections we plan to administer to each group of mice. Our dependent variable is the amount of striatic lesions reduced. For control variables, we want our mice to be similar in age, weight, and health, and for them to be kept in the same living conditions. For the MSCs, we want them to be stored in the same brand of solution and for them to receive the same doses of saline and FBS. The first step of our process is to extract ESCs from early embryos taken from in vitro fertilization and abortion clinics. The early embryos will be in the blastocyst stage and the ESCs will be taken from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst. Once removed, they will enter a pluripotent state. 
To induce the ESCs into MSCs, the ESC cells will be co-cultured with the OP9 cell line, which are mouse cells taken from the bone marrow stroma line. This will induce mucodermal cell differ differentiation, especially with the addition of 20% fetal bovine serum to encourage a cell growth medium. To induce plaque psoriasis in the mice test group, the back skin of each mouse will be shaved and 62.5 milligrams of Aldera cream will be applied to the shaved area on the back. The process of application will be repeated for five to six days. The mice will be kept separate during then to reduce complications, but still handled with care. Lastly, we will inject the HESC derived MSCs into the mice trial group. Prior to injection, the sample of MSCs will be thawed from cryo storage and stored in a five, mill five milliliter isotonic saline solution. The first group will receive three injections over three weeks. The second group will receive four injections over two weeks. And the third group will receive five injections over three weeks. We will monitor any changes in severity and amounts of psoriatic lesions. And depending on the most effective treatment, we hope to one day apply to future human trial groups. With that being said, we thank you for the opportunity to present and we hereby conclude our proposal. Thank you so much for your presentations, Team One. We will now um, we will now have the floor open to the judges so they can ask any questions. And judges, you have five minutes to ask any questions and for the competitors to answer. I am in the call. Oh my God. Thank you very much. That was an excellent, uh, excellent proposal and, and excellent presentation. Really enjoyed that. I do have a question about how you um, determine the effectiveness um, of the treatment on your pariasis. You didn't really talk about uh, the, like, is it an all or nothing effect? Is there a gradation between, you know, if the treatment is partially effective? So can you talk a little bit about that and how you can determine it? Uh, the effectiveness of those different treatments? Um, so our primary approach to determine effectiveness was to monitor the gradations of the treatment of psoriasis. So we estimated that the trial group that received five injections would exhibit the most signs of recovery. We said that we would monitor the changes in the colors or the severity of the lesions and in comparison to, for example, the group that only received three, we are estimating that the number of like improvement or the overall improvement will increase as we go further up the number of injections given to each, each mice. So we plan to note down any changes we'd experience for every three hours. So I guess maybe the question is how can you stand, how will you be able to standardize that across the, the different groups so that you're making sure that your, your measure of the grade of the effect is standard when you're looking at your one set of mice versus the other sets of mice. So what we would plan to do for that is we would submit them to the same standardized sort of, well, firstly, what we do is we check to measure the numbers of lesions reduced because that would be all the more of a standardized thing across all groups. We would also conduct tests to determine their dermal health and potentially view the numbers of, because psoriasis, a common cause is the stem cells in the epidermis often exhibit problems with their immunomodulating properties resulting in the overproliferation of keratinocytes. They also are deficient in many areas. So what we would want to do is check the overall health of the cells in each trial group of mice and determine the rate of improvement for each one. I guess rela related to that, I was wondering if, first of all, great presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit or convince me that you don't need a control group that gets no drug or no MSCs at all um, as, a, as a baseline measurement that you could then evaluate the success of your treatment again. So I, I'm curious if you can convince me that you don't need that group. Um, and then my second question is, 
how do you validate the success of ESC to MSC uh, induction? Um, if I could just clarify on your first question. So um, by um, not using a control group, do you mean uh, foregoing the usage of mice in our experiment? So I, what I mean is that, so you have three groups that are receiving three different doses of the MSCs. But because there's no group that receives psoriasis but no MSCs, it's hard to compare success of the treatment to just spontaneous changes over time. So, so then when you have a control group that receives no treatment, but it does have, but they do develop psoriasis, then you can show your improvement with the application of the MSCs. In that case, I feel like we could probably implement a placebo group um, where no um, MSCs are injected for the treatment of psoriasis. So just to see how the um, gradation of like improvement can compare to uh, when we do actually use MSCs in our other groups. Yeah, so I think the addition of that group would really strengthen the power of your study because it's a really great idea. Yeah, and I also have the same question like Emily had, uh, which was that, like, how would you uh, determine that uh, MSCs were created? So uh, how you will isolate the specific MSC cells, uh, which you will inject because it will be a heterogeneous uh, population of cells. So that is one of my question. And also other is like, you were storing your cells at two to eight degrees. Like, why are you doing that? Uh, why you will not keep them at... 37 degrees, like uh, uh, which is the optimal temperature for them to be growing. So at two to eight degrees, they might start degrading or dying. Um, and yeah, and do you think human cells will be compatible will be with the mice cells, mice skin cells? So those are some of my questions. Um. In regards to the last question, Mr. Singh, um, we selected mice because they exhibit a range of biological and reactive similarities to humans and are frequently used in biological experiments. So due to their genetic similarities, we thought they'd be an appropriate group. The main reason we did not start immediately with human trials was mostly for patient safety in case there were any unwanted complications, then humans would not be affected. Um, if you don't mind, could you please repeat the question about cryo storage? I think in uh, your like experimental protocol, you said uh, you will be using a, like four, two to eight degrees Celsius for storing the cells or something like that, uh, or for the experimentation. So why is that? Um, we, after conducting some research in certain studies, um, there was a brand of solution named hypothermosol, which cell, which mesenchymal, mesenchymal cells were stored in at two to eight degrees, and they retained their immunomodulating properties for up to 72 hours. So we also referenced a study that used oleogenic gingival derived mesenchymal stem cells to treat a human patient with psoriasis. And in that, the cells were also stored at the same temperature. So we thought it would be best to replicate a previously successful experiment. Okay, uh, and last question again, Emily's one, which like how you will isolate specific uh, clones for MSCs, which are actually transformed, uh, like differentiated to MSC from embryonic stem cells. Yeah, so to clarify my question again, uh, um... Are you asking how like the differentiation process occurs from ESC to MECs? So you were just like, yeah, yeah. go ahead. I, I was gonna say, so I guess what we're what we're wondering is when you induce them to MSCs, you need a way to validate that they are actually in fact MSCs. So do you have any hypotheses about or experimental plans about how you can evaluate that or sort for um the specific the specific population that you want.
Um, it's a it's a it's a tough question. So I I think the the probably the the most straightforward way to do it, and the other judges can can weigh on in on this as well. I think would be to sort them for their expression of MSC specific um, markers. And then you would have a, you would induce them. And then you'd say you'd have, you'd predict 60 or 70% of them would be bona fide MSCs. And then you could sort for MSC specific markers and then have the, and then further sort of filter them down into, into the specifics. Yeah, absolutely. Like you can have a reporter gene, which is a specific marker of MSC, and then you can sort them by flow cytometry. And also you can take specific colonies, which look more like MSC, not like the embryonic stem cell. And then again, do the qPCR or something to see whether the gene's expression is exactly what profile matches the MSCs or not. Something like that. There. Thank you. Unfortunately, that is all we have time. That's all, all the time we have um, for team one. Thank you so much for your presentations. So we will now redesignate team one to attendees. And now if we can have team two um, be promoted for, um, a, uh, for a panelist. And if you guys um, can prepare for your presentations by sharing your screen, we will um, give you guys around five minutes to prepare. And whenever team two is ready, you guys can start your introductions by introducing yourselves for um, with like two short sentences. Um, so hello, my name is Prisha Patel and I am a freshman at White Oaks Secondary School. Um, hi, my name is Nuka Moody and I'm a freshman at Oak Ridge Trafalgar High School. Hello, my name is Nada Hamoudi and I'm also a freshman at um, Oak Ridge Trafalgar High School. Um, so our research proposal is based on the use of induced purpotent stem cells in type 1 diabetes. Abstract. Many people are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes each year. However, we have discovered new ways and techniques to program such stem cells to help with the treatment. Thus, we will be exploring both iPSCs and ESCs and determining why iPSCs are the better choice among the two. Additionally, we will be elaborating on different experiments and tests that can be performed for the use of iPSCs in the treatment of type 1 diabetes, and lastly, the distribution plan. What is type 1 diabetes? Type 1 diabetes, one of the two main types of diabetes, is a chronic condition in which the pancreas produces little or no insulin. Type 1 diabetes has no known cures, but there are several different treatment options available. The root cause of type 1 diabetes remains unknown. A few potential causes include genetics, viruses, and other specific environmental factors. Long-term type 1 diabetes can affect the heart, eyes, nerves, kidneys, and cause heart and blood vessel disease. What are iPSCs and ESCs? iPSCs are a form of purple stem cells that can be generated right from adult somatic cells by genetic reprogramming of the genes. These cells terminate the development of any type of human cell that is involved in therapeutic purposes. And in this case, they can be stimulated into becoming beta islet cells for the treat one, treatment for type 1 diabetes. What are embryonic stem cells? ESCs, akin to induced pluripotent stem cells, are pluripotent. ESCs can develop into a plethora of different cell types in the adult body, which, according to Science Daily, this number is approximately 220 cells. ESCs are harvested from three to five day old embryos in which they are referred to as blastocysts. Advantages and disadvantages. In terms of their advantages, embryonic stem cell research can lead to the discovery of treatment for diseases, injuries, and organ failure. As for disadvantages, there are many pressing bioethical concerns regarding this research. Embryonic stem cells are typically harvested from early stage embryos, which by itself has raised a number of ethical concerns. 
Many have issues with the fact that human embryos must be destroyed in order to harvest these embryonic stem cells. Regarding the negative aspects of iPSCs, the only issue is the utilization of retroviruses to generate iPSCs as they are related to cancer. The main reason why iPSCs are the better option, though, is due to the fact that they can be developed from the tissue of the same patient, thus avoiding immune rejection. We concluded that iPSCs would be, be the better choice because although both are capable of treating type 1 diabetes, iPSCs come with fewer ethical concerns and no immune rejection. Aims, significance, and hypothesis. The main goal of this proposal is to have iPSCs distributed within hospitals so that they can be utilized for the treatment of type 1 diabetes due to the fact that many are victims of this disease. To do so, we will be providing a proper plan as to how iPSCs will be introduced and utilized. Our prediction is that once iPSCs are distributed within hospitals, the death rate of type 1 diabetes will slowly start to decrease. Experiment. In terms of the experiment aspect, we would first test beta cell, iPSC beta cell creation within rodents. If effective, we will move on to testing pigs since it is proven that humans and pigs are genetically similar. Furthermore, pigs have similar skin to humans and often skin cells are utilized to make iPSCs. Finally, we will start to form tests on humans who have volunteered. Prior to testing on humans, there will be proper consent forms to be filled out that will require the signature of the patient. After careful monitoring, we would go on for further distribution. Timeline. After we have developed our plan and budget, we will begin with a public announcement two years prior to the implementation of iPSCs within hospitals. This would serve as a way to educate the public about iPSCs and our distribution plan. Our financial distribution plan would be laid out and after we will set into motion our iPSC tests on rodents, pigs, and a selective humans. These experiments will span over about a year. Moreover, a waitlist for patients who plan on receiving iPSCs will be created. As our experiments start to close, we will begin iPSC distribution in larger Canadian and American hospitals. Then the patients on the waitlist will receive iPSCs. After we will shift into wider distribution, meaning other countries and smaller hospitals. Budget. A portion of the money used to fund regular diabetes trial and treatment could be put into our own funds for our own cl clinical trials. Furthermore, donation boxes could be placed in buildings such as hospitals and grocery stores to gain public support and interest. In turn, there could be larger advertisements such as television ads, which discuss our need for donations and furthermore our cause. To make payment for patients easier, we could develop personalized payment plans that could be provided for patients who cannot afford the necessary treatment. The payment plan will be available to patients and their families in a month-by-month -month installment plan. Conclusion. To conclude our proposal, iPSCs are more effective in type 1 diabetes treatment and have less ethical concerns than that of ESCs. Our experiment would consist of several different tests on rodents, pigs, and a select group of humans spanning at least 12 months before further implementation and distribution of iPSCs within hospitals. Thank you. Thank you, Team 2. I will now open um, up for the judges to ask their questions for five minutes. I have two questions. Great job, you guys. The slides were beautiful. Um, and you all did a great job presenting. I wanted to know, um, I have two questions. The first of which is, how do you envision the iPSCs to be used specifically to improve type 1 diabetes? And then the second question is, how do you plan to deliver them to the patient? Um, so in terms of the first question, um, we would, can you repeat that for a second? I was just wondering how, so you talk about wanting to use iPSCs and give them to patients to improve type one diabetes. So I was wondering how you envision specifically that the iPSCs will improve outcomes or symptoms or, or treatment? Right, so um, they can be stimulated into becoming beta islet cells and these, the beta islet cells, they create um, insulin and insulin is what, what is needed to treat type one diabetes. And then the second question is, how do you envision delivering these to the patient? In regards to the second question, it would probably be through injections. Can I ask a question about um, it's and thank you very much. A very nice presentation. A great job. Um, can I ask a question about sort of do you have any plans or um, backup plans if something that's because it's a very ambitious program and what happens? Well, what happens if it doesn't work? the way that you anticipate it would work. 
Have you thought about any backups? And, and sort of second to that, how would you know it's successful? So in your rodents uh, test, how will you know that your treatment has been successful and, um, and that it's okay to move to the next stage, which would be the, treat, the treatment in pigs? So um, regarding the second question, we would first um, see if any insulin is being produced within these rodents after we have given them iPSCs. And if it does, we would check at what, like, at what level the insulin is being produced and, to, and make sure that it's safe for a, human body to, for a human body to have that much insulin in their body. And, and would you look for um, like secondary side of, like side effects that maybe would be detrimental to? Yes. Yeah, so if there are any side effects, we, we could always look into that and then um, change the amount of iPSCs we give or um, stimulate them differently to uh, moderate with those side effects. Okay. And I think that sort of gets a little bit to the question around, do you have a backup plan? Should it not work the way you think it's going to initially? Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I have a one question. Um, so you said in the report that main uh, issue with iPSC is the use of uh, retroviruses to generate iPSCs. So do you think is the still case that we are still using retroviruses or methods have evolved to get around retroviruses to create iPSCs or something? Um, I think that we can we could try to uh, in our test we can always try to do uh, iPSC tests without using retroviruses before, and then um. We would, and even if we do do it with the retroviruses, then we would see at like, at what um what are the chances of getting cancer? Yeah, so some there, there's some new methods now like piggyback vector, uh, or you can use even CRISPRs to integrate some uh, like transcription factors in the genome, so you don't need retrovirus anymore. So that is a good for the field that you can use iPSs without being worried about these uh, retroviruses. So yeah, you can include that in your proposal. That's good. I think uh, that's all the questions for me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, thank you all for the questions. It was a really insightful presentation, team two. We will now redesignate you to attendees for team two. So if team three can now get ready for their presentations by sharing their slides, and we will also give you guys around five minutes for your presentations. And also for team three, as you guys are getting ready, if you guys can introduce yourselves, it would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I'll go first. Hi, my name is Kathy. I am a fourth year biomedical student at Ryerson University. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a fourth year cell biology student at the University of Alberta. And I'm Hannah. Um, I'm in second year studying molecular genetics at University of Toronto. Can everyone see the slides? Yep. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, then I guess we will go ahead. Hello, my name is Jessica. My teammates are Hannah and Kathy. And today we will be pitching an iPSC vaccine that targets I-type stem cells in high-risk neuroblastoma. So what is cancer? Cancer is a disease where human cells start dividing and proliferate uncontrollably, as you could see on the diagram. This leads to two types of tumors. Benign tumors do not have continued growth and cause compression in their specific region of growth, and malignant tumors have continued growth and can metastasize. Immunotherapy for cancer is a method of treatment where the host's immune system is used to attack cancer. 
most immunotherapies show regressed tumor sizes and sometimes remission in patients. Well, stem cells are actually very similar to cancer cells, which makes them useful for immunotherapy. They both proliferate rapidly, divide indefinitely, and are less differentiated than normal cells. And they're also found to have shared antigens, which led some scientists to wonder if stem cells could be used as a vaccine to prime the immune system against cancer. So embryonic stem cell vaccines were actually shown to prevent tumor growth in mice as early as the 1900s, but progress in this area has stalled due to the ethical issues of using embryonic cells. But we can now bypass this by using induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs, which are produced from somatic cells. Since iPSCs are also easier to, to obtain and can be produced as needed from the patient cells, they're great for manufacturing a vaccine. And iPSCs are also derived from the patient's own cells. So they will most likely um, be more similar to the patient's cancer cells, and this will trigger a more targeted personalized immune response. So neuroblastoma is a cancer derived from immature nerve cells in the sympathetic nervous system that affects mainly infants and children. If the neuroblastoma is classified as high risk, over 50% of all children diagnosed do not survive past the age of five due to resistance to current cancer therapies. So because of this, clinicians are trying to develop a more effective way to treat high-risk neuroblastoma. One of the genetic markers they're looking at are I-type stem cells. So in neuroblastoma, there's three types of stem cells. There's N-type, S-type, and I-type. And these I-type stem cells are associated with significantly worse patient outcome. So our proposed iPSC vaccine will be used as a preventative treatment to target high-risk neuroblastoma by selecting iPSCs that are similar to the I-type neuroblastoma cells using the soft agar assay. The soft agar assay selects for I-type stem cells and doesn't select for N and S-type stem cells because it looks at a property called anchorage independence. So anchorage independence refers to the ability of cells to grow without attachment to a flat surface. So the way the soft agar assay does this is it's comprised of a bottom layer that prevents the cells from sticking to the bottom of the petri dish and then a top layer where the cells grow in suspension. So here's what such an assay would look like. Um, these dark purple spots represent neuroblastoma colonies and because they're able to survive the soft agar assay, we can indirectly infer that these cells have a lot of I-type stem cells. Our hypothesis is that by injecting non-tumorigenic iPSCs that resemble the I-type stem cells in high-risk neuroblastoma, we'd effectively be able to prevent the onset of this condition by priming the immune system. So in our experiment, we'll use a mutant mouse strain that's very susceptible to neuroblastoma. And we will transfect fibroblasts from this mouse with Yamanaka factors to produce iPSCs. Now, some of these will be used for a general iPSC vaccine, and the others will be sorted using the soft agar assay to get the most I-type-like iPSCs, and these will be used to make an I-type targeted vaccine. Both vaccines will be irradiated before use, which prevents the iPSCs from forming tumors in the body. And neuroblastoma cells will also be obtained from the same mouse and then sorted again using the soft agar assay to get the I-type uh, neuroblastoma cells that we will use to infect our mice and test how effective our vaccines were. Our experiment will inject mice in the control group with saline. Our experiment group A will be injected with general iPSCs and our experiment group B will be injected with the I-type like iPSCs. These injections will be done over three weeks and then the mice will be injected with the I-type neuroblastoma cells. Our expected results will show tumor formation in the control group, reduced tumor formation in the group A and least tumor formation in group B. Our proposed budget needs a total of $930. Overall, the experiment is low in cost and will provide large scale benefits to the healthcare community and immunotherapy research. Thanks, that's it for our group. Thank you everyone in team three. So judges, you may now start asking your questions for five minutes. First of all, great job. That was a great presentation. And I, I liked the, the techniques that you used and your, your graphics were great. Um, my first question is what makes the eye type stem cells so potent? What is it about them? Um, well, it's, it's that they're more resistant to cell death, I guess you could say. Um, it's, 
Neuroblastomas are each comprised of a mixture of N, S type, and I type stem cells. And some neuroblastomas have more of one type than another. It's not so much that the I type stem cells are more potent, it's that they're more harmful. So, so how you, basically, what we are like, trying to do. It, oh, sorry. What we are trying to do is target healthy. them and make them to just select for the ones that have the I type stem cells. So, how do you identify them? Like, if you're if you're in the clinic and you're trying to evaluate the the danger of a of a particular um, neuroblastoma, is there a way you can identify more aggressive tumors by the presence of? I guess, like, I'm wondering if there's a marker for them. That's kind of where the soft agar assay comes in. It's not so much a marker. We don't really have a marker for it. So okay. we use this technique to select for cells that have it. I guess you could say the marker would be Anchorage independence because the I types, um, the cancers with a lot of I type stem cells have Anchorage independence and those without, uh, okay. or those with more N and S type don't. Okay. And then my next question is, how do you envision evaluating the, the degree of tumor formation in the animals? So beyond just reduced, like yes or no binary, like yes, there is a tumor, no, there isn't. In terms of actually looking at the tumors, can you think of some ways you could, you could evaluate them or, or what were you kind of envisioning? Um, we were planning on just kind of measuring the tumors. So we were planning on if they surpassed one millimeter in size, we would um, assume that the treatment didn't work and we would euthanize the mouse. But in this case, because we are working with mice, we would need to just measure them and see which one shows a smaller or a larger tumor. Yeah, to add on to that, we could also um, observe overall, like dissect the mice after and see if there's been like metastasis or more aggressive, like tumor spreading. Yeah, I was thinking it would be it would be cool to do that and then also to look at the tumors themselves so you could fix them and then look at their expression of proliferation markers or different tumor markers to see if you're changing the the dynamics of the tumors themselves with your with your vaccine. That's it for me. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, maybe I'll go ahead. Um, so great presentation, great background on everything. Um, so in you mentioned in your report that um, if you use uh, ESCs, then the researchers were able to like cure the uh, colon cancer uh, using vaccine, but not with I IPSCs. So why do you think your way of using IPSCs will work while others didn't work. So are you doing something special about it or how you will address yeah. the situation? So to speak to that, um, there was two previous studies that we kind of built on. One was in 2009 where they used human ESCs and the human ESCs work, but human IPSCs didn't work. Um, but some uh, things that they kind of overlooked that another future study addressed was that they used like human um, ESCs and human cancer cell lines in uh, mice though, so that might um, have different effects because they're different uh, species and could have different immunological effects. And a later study in 2018 actually showed that the uh, an IPSC vaccine that could reduce um, tumor growth in mice using um, like mouse derived uh, uh, like IPSCs and cancer cell lines from the same strain. So that might be more reflective of what a vaccine would actually be like is to get IPSCs um, targeted uh, that are similar to um, the patient's own cancer cells from the same species and the same individual. Uh, and also that uh, experiment supplemented their vaccine with CPG, uh, which is an immunostimulatory molecule. And that was also part of um, how they made their IPSC vaccine more effective, I suppose. So um, we haven't dug too much into the immunotherapy uh, side of our vaccine just for the sake of time. Um, but I think we would, could look into as well, um, adding these supplements uh, that would stimulate the immune system more and um, kind of amplify the response. But also since um, there haven't been any IPSC vaccines targeted at neuroblastoma specifically as of yet, we thought, we would just uh, as well just propose the idea, first of all, of 
um, trying it on this other type of cancer in mice. Oh, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, so uh, two more questions. Uh, so can you measure somehow like the expression of uh, oncofetal uh, antigens in the iPSCs you create or something uh, like uh, quantitatively? Uh, second thing is uh, how can you determine the specificity of the uh, cancer like uh, treatment? So like it's going going specially for the neural cells only or neuroblastoma cells. It's not targeting any other cell type in the body where, again, it can do a lot of other things. So yeah, specificity is my question. Yeah. Yeah, I could answer first for specificity because uh, from previous studies, they did assess the if there was any like autoimmune effects, if they have attacked like normal adult stem cells that are like kind of supposed to be or like not stem cells but like progenitor as you like to say um and they didn't find any like significant effects and we could probably replicate those tests to see if there's any autoimmunity um as well but they didn't find uh like any autoimmunity i think mainly due to um the fact that uh they express a lot less oncofetal antigens compared to uh, like embryonic cells and uh, cancer cells. So uh, yeah, so that was kind of covered in previous studies. Um, I can answer with regard to specificity to neuroblastoma. So studies have shown that these three types of stem cells are unique to immature neural, immature nerve tissue. So the vaccine would only be targeting nerve tissue plus something I didn't elaborate on for the sake of time is the area in which neuroblastoma tends to form, which is either the chest or the abdominal area. So we could selectively target neuroblastoma by injecting the vaccine in these areas because we can, we can avoid other neural conditions such as glioblastoma, for instance, that forms in the brain by just not targeting that site as the primary injection site for the vaccine. And in terms of, I think also the question was like how to assess if the oncofetal antigens are expressed. Um, yeah, we could do additional assays like um, of, of our IPSC vaccines and then see um, their like genetic and epigenetic profiles or like transcriptomes um, as uh, like there are previous assays that have been able to show the similarities between stem cells and uh, cancer cells. So I think we would just try to replicate those assays um, to kind of verify that the ones that we produced are similar um, in terms of like the, the proteins and the antigens that they express. Awesome, sounds good, yeah, thanks. That's great. Thank you very much. I uh, really enjoyed reading your proposal and that was a very nice presentation. So uh, I did want to follow up. You said neuroblastoma is mostly in the chest. Yes. It's, not uh, a... it's mostly in the abdominal area because it, it's not actually in the brain because the cancer itself comes from nervous, like immature nervous tissue, which originates in that area. So the cancer forms before it migrates up to the brain. Okay. So you're, you're cause the question I was going to ask is that, um, how would you know that your vaccine is able to penetrate into the brain um, th through the blood brain barrier, which is a very effective um, ba barrier to stop a lot of um, entities getting into the brain? But Absolutely. Well, fortunately we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> I don't really have any other questions, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations, team three. We will now redesignate you to attendees. So the final team for today, we have team five and you guys can 
um, prepare for your presentations and we will give you guys five minutes to prepare for your presentations. And meanwhile, you guys can also introduce yourselves. That'll be great. Thank you. Whenever you guys are ready, you guys can give your two sentence introductions. Hi, For my sure. name is I'm a freshman at the University of Toronto. Hi, uh, my name is Asman. I'm a third year student at the University of Waterloo. I'm studying health science, uh, specializing in public health. Thank you. Are you guys ready? Yep. Okay, so um, you may now start. So our topic is developing brain organite using IPSC. So uh, we will be de developing a 3D brain organite using IPSC. We will specifically working on pituitary gland. We chose pituitary gland because it, it, it it, 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 the studies can use for drug discovery and research in brain tumor. Pituitary gland is responsible for regulating essential hormones and blood pressure for re reproduction. Since organite can be this organite can be maintained for several years and a year long, so we can use it for later events and research. Hi. So. Uh, we decided to use IPSCs. Uh, IPSCs uh, are used for a lot of different types of organoids. Uh, in this case, we're looking specifically at brain organoids. Brain organoids are basically uh, introducing IPSCs to uh, different types of uh, cells to make it grow into brain tissue. And in this case, you'd introduce IPSCs to neural tissue, uh, a cerebral tissue just to make it into that type of organoid. And then for example, if you introduced a uh, pituitary gland tissue to an IPC, it would grow into a pituitary organoid. And the purpose of our research, we discovered that there was a little bit of a gap in uh, the literature. There were different organoids being developed for the cerebellum, the uh, frontal cortex, but there, and even the anterior pituitary gland, but there was a um, organoid missing for the posterior pituitary gland. So we're going to delve into how to develop that. And the reason we're developing this type of organoid is because there are two challenges that we see in organoids these days. One is vascularization. So that means that a lot of the organoids die off after about 100 days because blood is not circulating through the organoids properly. And another issue we're seeing is a lack of specification or in, in organoids. And in that case, it's because it's usually a very simple cluster of um, brain tissues rather than what we usually see with the brain. And the main issue from that is that we can't specialize in any kind of medicine or we can't make as detailed observations because the information is just a little bit lacking. So the way we're gonna go about this, oh, sorry. And the reason we chose IS uh, induced pluripotent cells over the embryo cells is mainly because it's a lot easier to grow organoids with induced pluripotent cells 
And furthermore, a lot of the disadvantages that come from induced pluripotent cells, for example, cancer, are uh, mitigated using different types of uh, techniques, for example, using mRNA as a method of delivering the um, specification instead of a um, instead of a capsule. So in this experiment, we were working with pituitary gland with gland sensors in the body and sends, sends different signals to other glands to regulate their function and maintain appropriate environment as well as setting environment as the gland also sets per body and sends different signals to other glands and regulate their function. Immune and inflammatory processes appear to improve with the pituitary gland. Stem cell population during tumor growth in the gland. This the, the pituitary gland is also responsible for maintaining blood pressure and other regulatory hormones. Um, so we analyze different drugs. We can use this research for analyzing different drugs and tumor. The aim for our experiment is to use the cues to make complete pituitary organoids, allowing for analysis for drug and drug discovery. The hypothesis that we use for this experiment is to find out that the mean for differentiation cues from the gene sequencing. Okay. Right, so the methodology for this is that I will get a sample from a fetus uh, and basically individualize the cells to a single cell so that we could use next level, next generation gene sequencing and that is called single cell RNA sequencing. And in this case, uh, we'd probably get the sample from uh, a brain bank rather than using online pre-built uh, genome sequences, just because there is a lack of posterior pituitary gene sequencing. And one of the benefits of this study is that if the results aren't as we expect, we could still provide to the academic community a gene sequence of the, the posterior pituitary, pituitary cells. And we'll go about this uh, experiment by uh, breaking down the, the, the tissue from the, the sample and then using a FASC, which is a uh, individualizer. It basically, um, make cells individualized. So it's, it's just a single cell using a fluorescent tag. And these fluorescent tags can be specified to the type of cell that we're looking at. For example, from the hypothalamus and from the pituitary. And the reason we're using a hypothalamus is because the pituitary, the posterior pituitary mainly grows from the hypothalamus. So we could identify those progenitor cells that are involved in this growth so that we can better understand what cells are, what cells and transcriptions are involved in growing the pituitary uh, cells. So first we just uh, individualize the cells and then we'd run a SC RNA sequencing on them. So we could find out exactly what kind of transcription uh, factors are involved. And there's usually uh, just two kinds, there's inhibitors and growth factors. And then uh, from those, we can discover uh, which ones to introduce to in, uh, induce pluripotent cells. And then uh, as we've seen before, if the environment is uh, properly uh, made in the matrix, then that induced pluripotent cell will grow into that type of tissue. And we've seen this before in several studies, which uh, coincidentally happen every two years. sorry to interrupt, that was your seven minute mark. Um, and Thank you for your presentations, team five. Uh, and thank you, judges. Uh, you have five minutes and please ask your questions. Um, so can I ask in your proposal, and thank you very much for your proposal and for your presentation. In your proposal, you, um, are, you state you will use PAC bio sequencing. Can you, Tell me a little bit about why you chose PacBio over maybe some of the other uh, sequencing methods that are available, particularly if you're looking at doing, trying to do some RNA-seq. Right. 
So we chose pack biosequencing because they actually have a, a cheaper deal with uh, Illumina, which is the sequencing model that we're using. So that's actually the main reason why we chose PacBio. Sorry, um, PacBio has a cheaper, oh, they're cheaper than Illumina. Yes. Um, do you know if there are any limitations to the use of PacBio versus Illumina? Um, you know, differences in the type of sequencing? Um, oh, so for example, uh, oh yes. <laughs> So with PacBio, they do long RNA sequencing. So that's the main point of what we're trying to do here. Uh, with short sequencing, we might miss some kind of transcription, but with uh, PacBio, we can get the whole uh, transcriptome. Okay. Um, and do you, uh, do you think you're going to need any bioinformatic tools that will help you in, um, understanding and, 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 and reading the, uh, your transcriptome? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, especially uh, for identifying the type of cells, we'd probably need some sort of deep learning uh, algorithm to identify every single individual cell, make sure that they're correct. And then we would use some sort of bioinformatic tool, uh, especially some sort of um, analyzer to see uh, the sequencing and then identify some patterns that we can we can uh, use to identify cues for growth. You may not have enough data for a deep learning tool yet, but um, yes, okay. yes, uh, we're kind of hopeful because there are some breakthroughs uh, as seen with um, protein folding. So hopefully, uh, and maybe sometime in the future, uh, there will be some deep learning for transcriptome sequencing as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, maybe I'll go ahead. So I think just to simplify uh, what you're trying to do is here, like identify the transcription factors or like the uh, other uh, proteins, which will help in the uh, transformation of iPSCs to pituitary gland with the help of single cell rna seq analysis yes okay so so there is some single cell rna seq data available already on brain uh, there have been attack seq there have been rna seq um, there also you can use that already available data to undermine what uh, transcription factors you want to specifically introduce in there. Uh, so my question is there like, so that is separate, like you will identify all these uh, using bioinformatics and other tools, but how can you use single cell RNA-seq to make sure that when you are like uh, differentiating your iPSCs to pituitary gland, uh, that they are actually expressing the transcription factors or proteins which you want to Hi, so uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we'll make sure by using, that's why we're using a fetus for the individualization of the cells because during fetal growth is when the pituitary comes out of the hypothalamus and differentiates into a pituitary. So by using it at that exact seat, uh, at that moment, then it is uh, with higher likelihood that we'll find a transcription of those uh, specific cues. Although, although I understand that there are some uh, chances that we might not actually encounter those cues, the abundance of the cells that we're using, I think it's about 100,000, but most likely uh, there'd be some loss uh, of cells, but using that sheer amount will have some power so that we can um, like significantly say that those transcriptions that we find uh, are in fact for the cues. Yeah, that's cool. But yeah, you still have to kind of select those specific single cells also. Yeah. Yes, uh, and hopefully we could select those using the FACS, the mm. um, cytocalorimetry. Yeah, yeah. And for that, you have to kind of tag them with some reporter yes. or use some RNA fish or something like that yes. to isolate them, yeah. I guess like in a in a simpler, less expensive, 
approach, what about using something like um, just immunofluorescence of the organoid that you develop to simply see what sort of like your RNA-seq, your preliminary RNA-seq that you're proposing presumably will give you a set of markers that you should, that you could and should use to validate that. But I'm like, I think the simpler approach is to actually look in vivo at the organoid to see if you have expression of those factors at the protein level um, as, as compared to just jumping right to doing the, the single cell seek. Right, that, that's actually a really good point. The only reason that we're kind of uh, deterred from that pathway is just because when you leave a organoid unguided, most of, sometimes the tissues uh, grow in ways that you don't expect, and then it might be a little bit more difficult to find those uh, cells that we want to look at specifically. And then in this case, we could find those because like we actually grew them. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, interesting presentation, Team 5. Thank you. Uh, we will now redesignate you to attendees. So this marks the end of all presentations for the research competition. Thank you to all of the competitors that put in the effort to write the proposals and your presentations. The competition results will be released in a, a week after the conference, so judges will have time to review the competition materials. We wish all teams the best of luck. I would also like to extend our sincere thank yous to the judges, Dr. Gilbert, Mr. Singh, and Dr. Dewar for their time and contribution to the research competition. I loved all of the insightful questions you guys asked to the competitors. So right now we have about 30 minutes um, left until the next section. Feel free to come back at 2.05 if you want to attend the research hall breakout sessions and feel free to explore the bioethics and law and business hall as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great uh, uh, presentation and organizing everything, thanks. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you. So we will send you our results uh, directly or? Yes, it would be through email. Okay. For and you want us to just, is it just ranking one, two, and three? Is that, that was what it originally said? Or do you want us to provide scores for all of the groups? Yes, um, the, by providing the scores, we will um, determine this, the rankings. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks again.
So I hope everybody enjoyed the case competitions. Now we will be listening to three special guests who are experts and are at the forefront of stem cell research. To all the attendees, you guys are welcome to explore the bioethics and also the law and business halls. I would also like to remind the audience that this session is being recorded. I also want to mention that there will be a Q&A session after the presentations and you are welcome to ask questions by typing them into the chat. I will then select some questions for answering. Or if you feel comfortable doing so, you may also raise your hand by selecting the option below in the panel. And we will also allow you to turn on your mics to ask questions. All right, our first speaker is Dr. Alessandro Markin. We will promote Dr. Markin as panelist. So Dr. Alexander Markin, PhD, has been a research associate at the Health Law Institute since 2015. His work focuses on the dissemination of health information. He has led and contributed to the research projects exploring how the media represents key health and science policy issues related to the topic of genetics, stem cell research, alternative health therapies, vaccination, and health-related marketing. His work has been published widely in academic journals such as Nature's Genetics and Medicine, the Journal of Law and Biosciences, Regenerative Medicine, and the Journal of Medical Internet Research. His presentation title is Stem Cells Online, Fake News, User Testimonials, and Commercial Marketing. Dr. Mark and everyone. Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Jackie, can you hear me? Give yeah. a thumbs up there. Yeah. Oh, great. So I'm joining you guys from Edmonton, Alberta, where I work at the... Um, Health Law Institute based in the Faculty of Law. And what we're gonna do is just kind of look at all kinds of online discourse that's circulating right now around stem cells. Um, as you see in the bottom left there, that's my email and as well as my Twitter handle. If you have some questions that maybe we don't get to answer in this session, feel free to uh, yeah, send me an email and I'll see if I can answer them. So our health law uh, team based in the University of Alberta kind of looks at this nexus between health, uh, health, and health sciences, uh, law and policy and media, and where it's led by a research director up there in the top left, Timothy Caulfield. And my particular role is to focus a lot on the media and specifically changing media dynamics. Um, when we talk about stem cells or the way that we look at stem cells is often through this lens of science hype. And you may have heard that term or not or come across it, but Science hype is defined by uh, Professor Caulfield um, is when the state of scientific progress, the degree of certainty in models or bench results or the potential applications of research are exaggerated. So we see a disconnect between how the science is presented and what the clinical evidence says or what the scientific evidence says. And another term that people commonly used to talk about science type, particularly in um, Australia and the UK is permissory sciences. And this can again apply to lots of all areas of science, not just stem cells. This again is the idea that you know the discourse that exists around scientific developments in a particular field over promise what the science will lead to. And there's a really nice piece here um, that's led by Timothy Caulfield called Confronting Stem Cell Hype. If you don't know this piece and you're interested in these ideas, that would be a really good place um, to access this kind of information. When we talk about science hype, um, we don't necessarily attribute it or we never attribute it to just one actor, but rather there's all kinds of different actors and forces that are influencing science hype. This is from Professor Caulfield from a paper called Science and the Sources of Hype. And Professor Caulfield has added a couple little red uh, markers on this, like political pressure and social media that also tie into this hype pipeline, kind of how, how it's generated, how hype is generated. So at the top, we have political fresh pressure. We have, you know, the funding of science that goes on, for example, with Trudeau announcing 20 million in funding for stem cell research, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, who famously promoted and gave funding to a lot of stem cell research in the United States when he was the governor of California. And I just recently read his autobiography, Total Recall, which is probably 400 pages too long of Arnold, if I'm honest. But interestingly, he talks a lot about stem cells and comes back to stem cells often um, about how proud he was as one of his political achievements. But yeah, we get this political pressure because the funding's gone on. This leads to publication pressure from people that have received funding. It leads to commercialization pressure, which is spread out through media and institutional press releases. It comes into um, the public interest or expectations that people have for the science to produce in the ways that it's being described, which leads to marketing and commercialization of products. And then it leads to like a scientific bag wagon or large groups of people thinking about a science in inaccurate or inaccurate ways. 
And so I wanted to talk about the, uh, the Health Law Institute, just because the Institute has been working on these, um, these ideas for a really long time. This is a paper from 2008. And what it's doing is analyzing uh, stem cell clinics online, how they promote their services. So the summary from this study, basically this study was asking three questions. What sorts of therapies are being offered in these um, stem cell clinics? How are they portrayed? And what's the clinical evidence to support these therapies? And as they conclude here, they find the portrayal of stem cell medicine on the websites is optimistic and un unsubstantiated by peer review literature. They say websites generally portray therapies as safe, effective, and ready for routine, routine use in a wide variety of conditions. In contrast, the published clinical evidence is unable to support the use of these therapies for routine treatment of disease. So the direct-to-consumer portrayal of stem cell medicine is optimistic and unsupported by published evidence. So this is again from 2008. And again, this is this uh, project was led by Professor uh, Obaka Ogbugu, um, who's still affiliated with the Health Law Institute. And they revisited this study in 2013. And the reason they did so is because there was an increased rise in stem cell tourism and also it was perceived as an increased level of scrutiny around these kinds of um, stem cell marketing practices and clinics. And so they revisited to see if it was getting better, as the title of this paper says. What they found in the results is our analysis reveals similarities between historical and current stem cell treatment offerings, claims, representations of risk, benefit, and efficacy, and attention to social, ethical, and regulatory concerns. Claims and representations remain overly optimistic. So they're, as they conclude here, increased scrutiny of stem cell tourism has had not much impact on the online claims of clinics that provide putative, unproven stem cell treatments. So basically, it's, you know, it's not getting better, it's actually growing. And there's a lot of work done in this regard. Um, these two individuals are here at this very talk, probably in another Zoom room, where I think Professor Schneider is speaking a bit later, but they've done extensive work on stem cell clinics, as well as crowdfunding. And yeah, they're giving talks today, or their work is really worth checking out in this regard. Just to go back to the idea of media, um, initial study that was done again at the Health Law Institute around stem cell hype was around the media portrayal of therapy translation. So this was, excuse me, this was a study that was done in 2015. And what was done here is they analyzed um, in the popular press articles that were written in Canada, the United States and the United Kingdom between 2010 and 2013. Again, just looking at kind of how stem cell therapies were portrayed. And as they mentioned here, our content analysis reveals that, realize, reveals that press coverage has shifted from ethical, legal, and social issues to clinical translation issues, and highly optimistic timelines were provided with no substantial change in representation over time. So again, this over-promising, this kind of hyping of the science. Interestingly, scientists were the dominant voice with respect to translation timelines. The findings raise questions about the degree to which media's overly optimistic slant fosters unrealistic expectations regarding the speed of clinical translation and highlight the ethical responsibility of stem cell researchers, <coughs> researchers as public communicators. And again, they, they conclude here that given that the media professionals traditionally rely on the scientific community as a major source of science news, our findings that scientists have provided in most, most cases authoritative statements either by implication or through a direct quote regarding unrealistic timelines for stem cell therapies raises a more general concern about the role of scientists as public communicators. There's clearly a need to raise awareness among translational stem cell researchers regarding the importance of conveying realistic translation timelines to the popular press. And this reminds me a lot of what um, health journalist Gretchen Reynolds was speaking about at a conference that I was at. Um, she spoke after me and uh, she had such great information to share with the public there. She's a researcher, sorry, for the New York Times. And her one of her big takeaways from her talk was that if you're a scientist or a researcher and you get approached by the media to discuss your research, you really need to help those journalists understand your work. It's not enough to speak to them like you're speaking to other scientists in the field. And one of the key reasons that she mentioned for this is because they might be either a new journalist, they might have just graduated from journalism school, and this might be one of their first projects, or they might be transitioning or been given a health file or a health column to write, and they might actually not know a ton about specific health topics. They might have general ideas, but they might not know the specifics. Secondly, you really need to work on helping them curb the hype. So this is what was mentioned again in that, in that published piece there. You need to help them understand what kind of science is being produced. Is it an observational study? Is it a mice study? And then again, to be realistic about the expectations that you have from that work. Of course, now we have a very changing media landscape all across the world. We have more and more people using social media. You might think that this is a given that, of course, more people are using social media, but there was talk that maybe people would be abandoning Facebook or abandoning Twitter, and we haven't seen this being the case. Um, new platforms exist like TikTok, and more people just continue to use them. 
here in Canada. This is a bit old, it's from 2018, but we have about 85% of the people in Canada using Facebook, 60% using YouTube, et cetera. You can see there 42% on Twitter and 9% on Reddit. What I find interesting about this is, excuse me, you, you look at 9% on Reddit and you think, well, that's tiny, but that's basically one in 10 people are using Reddit sometimes to, to access information, which it's actually quite a bit. So of course, with new media, we're creating new information dynamics. Um, this is an excellent piece that was published in Scientific American by two authors who work a lot on how information, specifically misinformation spreads, um, the algorithms that are involved and how the algorithms promote um, attractive information that's not necessarily accurate, how bots play a role in information circulating and how it's really tough to kind of fight back against misinformation. Another scholar who does excellent work in this regard is um, Kate Starbird, who's a kind of a disinformation expert. And she talks, as you can see in that image down there, a lot about polarization or echo chambers, how people are only speaking to people similar to themselves. And of course, fake news, it's, it's been around for a while, but it's become um, a real popular term or it, it was more popular. Now we tend to talk about misinformation and disinformation. But if people can, does anyone recall what was kind of the big event of fake news kind of popping back into our social consciousness? It was the case of Pizzagate, which really kind of kicked it all off. This was the idea that was being promoted online that Hillary Clinton and the Democrats were running these kind of pedophilic rings out of a pizza place in Cleveland where they were harvesting the blood of children for like satanic cults. Um, and that was kind of the big rise of our modern iteration of, of fake news. We know science has shown us this is from Gordon Pennycook and colleagues. Um, Gordon Pennycook is now a researcher at the um, University of Virginia. It does really interesting work on fake news and misinformation. And they just showed in this study that even if you know the information is fake, when you're exposed to the information more and more, it starts to become more credible. Um, this doesn't work on things that are entirely false, but if there's a potential for something to not be true, if you keep seeing fake information, it, it actually affects your, your cognitive process. And misinformation studies, of course, have been done um, with COVID going on. There's a lot of work going on around COVID misperceptions. This was a study that was done from lots of colleagues from Toronto and, and McGill. And what they found is that um, there's misinformation um, in the popular press, but there's way more of it on Twitter. So basically it's worse on social media, which perhaps is no surprise to anyone. And they say here, we find that exposure to social media is associated with misperceptions regarding basic facts around COVID-19, while the inverse is true for news media. So news media was do basically doing a better job. These uh, misperceptions are now in turn associated with lower compliance with social distancing measures. So, you know, of course, people that are going online are more likely to not follow advice of health professionals or not be accurate um, in the information that they're receiving. So we took this idea back in 2017 and we wanted to analyze the idea of fake news portrayals of stem cells and stem cell research. So what we did is we accessed this um, database called Open Sources, which was made by this scholar, um, Melissa Zimdars in the United States. Um, I'd like to especially give credit to her and her colleagues for running this database. It was a really great one that was up. I'm not sure who's running it now. And interestingly enough, she received um, so much hate mail and kind of vitriol for running this site that she had to step away from it. So I do really want to give her credit for being brave and running sites like this. And this has happened to other people that have published uh, blacklist, for example, in predatory journals that they can be exposed online and get a lot of bots and hate mail and stuff coming back at them. So she was running this great database of fake news websites, junk news, um, clickbait news, et cetera. So they had labeled sites fake news or junk science. So we used sites that had been labeled like this, just some examples. And then we searched on these sites for stem cell or stem cells to see what kinds of articles were being produced. So we had around 185 articles in the data set talking about stem cells. And mostly they were talking about cancer. So in the field of cancer, next about growing or fixing body parts was the most common, general health related to diet, um, stopping or reversing non-cosmetic aging processes, and then there was, you know, quite a bit of stuff circulating around there about creating new creatures or reviving old ones, like reviving the woolly mammoth, letting it loose, um, things like this, human animal mixes, like chimeras, things like that. Overall, the, it wasn't necessarily that stem cells were harmful or beneficial, but kind of a mix. The trend was more beneficial, but there was quite a bit of harms associated with stem cells in there as well. And we saw surprisingly that a lot of these fake news sites were actually referencing specific science studies, um, but 60% of them were doing so. So there'd be a link to an actual study that was done. But the representations were extreme representations of, how, of that kind of work or stem cells in general, including hyperbolic cures and fears. So we have, for example, 
growing new teeth with stem cell dental implants. Um, this is a study, uh, an article published saying there's a simple vitamin that holds the key to restoring your stem cells and mitochondria to a biologically younger state. Uh, at the top there, yeast is a, a cause of cancer and tumor. It can kill both. Research conf confirms five-day fasting diet miraculously slows aging, can prevent death from heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And also mixed in here, we had some of these headlines with just crazy stories and intense fear, distrust, suspicion. Again, this was the Obama era. So we have the top there, scary as hell, soulless human animal chimeras now grown on US research farms, horrifying part human, part animal hybrid embryos. Obama approves plans to create human, animal human hybrid monsters, et cetera. And um, just as a side note, they talked a lot in these articles about the idea of a, a cancer industry. So um, medical professionals wanting to keep people sick so they could profit from, from their cancer. You can see a couple headlines in there talking about that. So in summary here, we had highly exaggerated, inaccurate claims regarding specific scientific publications. The articles often include source material from other blogs or websites or alternative media outlets. Um, Nunes articles made, you know, statements about fear or mistrust among medical practices in the government. So just kind of sowing this, um, yeah, distrust or fear in general. Um, and the stem cell news created on these websites, it's alarming. It could have repercussions for the general public seeking out so, uh, sound scientific information. Just want to come back to this idea here that the articles often included source material from other blogs or websites. What we saw in there a lot was this basically sharing of the same articles again and again with some different headlines or slightly different wording. But across these websites, they were basically sharing material. This website on the left, you might have heard of Natural News. It was run by this guy who was called the Health Ranger. His name's Mike Adams, the Health Ranger. And he, you know, promoted all kinds of misinformation on his website, including dangerous information around vaccines, like this story here that was published in 2018. And this page was heavily cracked down by Facebook. They actually banned, they called it a health conspiracy site. Um, so it was banned on Facebook. Again, you can see right up there, it's 2019, they kind of banned it. And people that have been tracking the ban that was put on them talks about, <clears throat> are talking now about how it's really tough to keep them off of social media. So this headline here is published in Vox from just this past year. Um, talks about the war that they're basically having on this site and how the content continually sneaks back on. So as you see there, we have natural news and its links to Mercola. And very interestingly, um, on this topic of Mercola, um, an investigative research that was done by the Washington Post showed that this Mercola is one of the most significant uh, funders of anti-vax information. So um, you know, the, this anti-vax advocacy group talks about it being kind of a national grassroots movement with lots of members. And as it says here, but over the past decade, a single donor has contributed more than $2.9 million to the National Vaccine Information Center, accounting for about 40% of the organization's fundings. That donor, osteopath physician Joseph Mercola, has amassed a fortune selling natural health products, core research show, including vitamin supplements, some of which he claims are alternative to vaccines. So this is just really interesting because when we think about fake news or misinformation, it's not um, disconnected silos, but actually very, there's some very connected networks that are working together and they can make use of social media algorithms to promote all of their websites at the same time. We think of another avenue online, YouTube, of course, it's used by so many. This was a study that was done again by colleagues from the HLI um, and um, other collaborators. So this um, is looking at patient testimonials of unproven stem cell treatments on YouTube. They looked at 159 YouTube videos and, and what they saw was providers capitalize on patient testimonials to market unproven stem cell treatments. Um, out of the 159 videos, they found that patients discussed health improvements in like 91% of them. They praised providers more than half. They recommended stem cell therapies to around a third. And interestingly, in around a third of the videos, the providers were posing questions to the patients, They're thereby directing narratives. So it's kind of like acting out some drama inside of the videos, but in very um, uh, specialized ways to kind of get the, the patient testimonials to speak about stem cells in certain ways. As they mentioned here, nearly all the videos described benefits as improving health, quality of life, or energy. This include like increased appetite or weight gain, strength, movement, flexibility, sensation, circulation, etc. cetera. Um, 
And in 58% of the cases, the patients, as I mentioned here, I mentioned before, were acting out the scene, sometimes before or after scene, showcasing health benefits such as improved mobility, decreased stiffness or increased flexibility by getting out of bed, clapping, grabbing objects, sitting up and performing exercises. And this is so important and interesting because we know that there's a lot of research coming out showing how influential these powers of narratives and personal anecdotes are to um, generate emotions, which in turn um, have greater permanence in our memories. We obviously remember these more, they're stickier. And because of that, um, they work at much better at generating clicks and likes on social media. They work really well on that clickbait kind of idea of sensationalism. Um, and of course, because that happens, they in turn create larger audiences. So we kind of have this cascading effect. Unfortunately, we're not in a large room, but if we were, I would ask you on YouTube, what do you think is the most watched stem cell related video or one of them anyway, I'm not sure if it's still relevant. You might've Googled stem cells before and seen it. It relates to this guy. Maybe you know who this guy is. That's the Joe Rogan experience. And the one of the most watched videos related to stem cells is Mel Gibson. Again, personal anecdote, narrative, talking about how stem cell therapy saved his dad's life. So it touches on all the things that we're, uh, we're talking about here. So lastly, um, a research project that we just recently involved in was looking at umbilical cord blood banking. Um, there's a, been a sig significant rise in private cord blood banking services um, going on. We research shows there's a lack of consumer awareness around what cord blood banking is and the stem cell uses that can come from it. There's been some issues reported on storage and retrieval. Um, the CBC article um, has ran a story on a couple that tried to retrieve their stem cells that were banked in private storage and were unable to do so, or there were great complications in doing so. And there's some tension that exists between public and private core loan banking initiatives discursively. Um, and what I mean by that is um, public banks typically promote public banks um, over private core blood banking, and they suggest that private core blood banking is not necessarily able to do the things that it says. So again, hyping kind of the, uh, the uses of, of banking privately. So with this kind of space going on, we sought to analyze the online marketing of the private cord blood banking companies. And we received uh, generous funding from Canadian Blood Services, the James Krepner Award to do so. So what we did is there's seven companies operating in Canada. And in February of last year, we cached their websites. We basically downloaded their websites into a platform that we could then analyze the discourse on there, about how they're marketing their services. So what we saw is a, a trend across all seven websites First, we have a presentation of what core blood is. So these kinds of deep descriptions of what it is and how it can be used. There's a detailing of why someone should store their core blood and core tissue. There's a presentation of the procedures. And at times, interestingly or not interestingly, I don't know, there's really, really detailed, um, elaborate details provided on the equipment that they use, including like all the specifications of the equipment storage and things like that, which I thought was a bit odd. There's of course a breakdown of pricing options. And so it's around a thousand bucks, typically Canadian to start and then $125 a year afterwards. And there's information about the company, including accreditation, uh, about us information, the experts that are affiliated, institutional collaborators, et cetera. And then particular attributes are kind of like rhetorical framings of their company. Um, in terms of use, the themes that we saw was typically a split between uses now and uses for the future. Now or current or today, they talk about treating over 80 diseases and disorders, very similar to what you see on some public core blood banking rhetoric. Um, and then more for the private angle is this kind of idea of a perfect match for you and your family is accentuated on the websites. For future uses, we really see a heavy promotion of potential applications. So we see, for example, many new potential applications are being developed every year. The likelihood of potential use is increasing. The most exciting use is yet to come. At some point in life or in the future, one in three people may benefit from stem cell therapies or regenerative medicine. Or we're on the cusp of being able to use these stem cells for lung cancer, breast cancer, heart disease, MS, lupus, AIDS, strokes, spinal cord damage, diabetes, cerebral palsy, kidney disease, many other diseases. So it's kind of heavy, heavy promotional uh, material exists. Interestingly, the likelihood of use, the websites either don't say anything about it, or when they do, they reference this um, paper here from 2008, and they typically portray it as around a one in 400 um, likelihood. And this is a quote here from this website inception. They say up to around a one in 200 chance that you or your family will benefit from stem cell transplant in your lifetime. It's obviously a conflict here, however, because research has shown that it's actually more in line with one in maybe several thousand is the likelihood of use. 
And further from the same paper, there's a 34 fold more core blood units stored in public core blood banks have been released for clinical purposes as compared with those released from private core blood banks. So it's just not necessarily true that the private core blood banks are using them anywhere near the, um, the numbers which they report they are or that they will be in the future. Additional themes, marketing characteristics that we saw on the website. Um, unsurprisingly, there's this idea that private core blood banking is superior to public banking increased accessibility, more storage, you can use them for more things, um, perfect match, you get to retain the rights to your, to your banking. Um, there's this messaging around limited storing options. So as I mentioned, some websites don't mention that there is a, a public option. And what they do instead is they really highlight this, throwing them in the garbage or storing with our company. So this discard waste or, or store privately. Um, this is right on the, um, the front page of some, um, one of the banks like Sells for Life as well as this year, access to stem cell source would otherwise be discarded as medical waste. So again, this is an incentive to store it, to take advantage of the opportunity kind of thing. Lots of testimonials on the website, five of the seven of detailed testimonials and quite extensive ones. There's excess stories around regenerative therapy, like this one here, which is on the front page. Um, talks about a boy with brain injury showing remarkable improvement after the stem cell procedure. Um, and then there's all kinds of testimonials um, that exist just around social benefits, um, this idea of insurance and taking advantage of an opportunity. We see here in the top left, cord blood banking allows you to enjoy the security knowing that you've given your child a distinct health advantage in life. As parents, we always want to be sure we do everything for our children to help them build a strong and healthy future. And we took so long to get pregnant and have a baby that in the last thing we wanted to do is put that child's life in danger. If there's anything you can do to protect your child, you're going to do it. So having... Um, I have three kids now myself, so I just know the information bombardment that new families can have around making choices and the kinds of things you can buy. You know, you get like bombarded with what kind of stroller to buy ends up being a massive decision and onesies, what kind of bottles you can use, like just, just tons of stuff. So it's kind of a, a vulnerable space for people to be in um, for this kind of messaging to take place. And that's some of the things that we summarize here, but more specifically looking at the law around problematic marketing by private umbilical cord blood banks. If you're interested, this is a great piece that kind of details um, specific regulations that are put in place by the Competition Bureau. Um, um, and the regulations they put in place into, into why some of this marketing is, is problematic in those terms. Um, as we summarize here really succinctly or really, um, yeah, just a short snippet of what's going on there. Private core blood banking marketing that aver, um, advertises hypothetical future treatments can be misleading and may influence consumer behavior. This marketing may breach existing advertising law, so regulatory bodies should you know, enforce the law and help uh, prevent public health and financial harm. So lastly, we've got a lot of hype existing online and new forms of this existing online with fake news and YouTube and online marketing. There's ongoing research showing about how this information that exists kind of inf uh, in impacts us more, the kind of biases that we have, how we're attracted more to negative news and to anecdotes. And so what we need to do is we need to, you know, continually and critically monitor the information that's out there to see how these spaces are evolving. We need to help counter misinformation and educate others. There's a lot of research that shows that debunking works. Um, Professor Caulfield, our research director, talks about that a lot. We need to be actively involved in helping spread good information, accurate information. And that's the last point there. We need to make sure the science that we're involved in is accurately represented in the popular media and in whatever avenue that we can. So that's it. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks um, to the SSSCR and some funding agencies. And again, down here in the bottom right is my email right down there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation, Dr. Markin. It was really informative to learn about how the media portrays stem cells, and especially with all of the interesting information and news out there about COVID. Um, and this marks the end of Dr. Markin's presentation. Uh, we will now redesignate you to attendee. Thank you so much, Dr. Markin. Thanks. Now we will switch gears to Dr. Stephanie Sia. Hi, Dr. Sia. We will now promote you to panelist. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so, Dr. Stephanie Sia, PhD, is an affiliate scientist at the Princess Margaret Center in the University 
Health Network. She obtained her PhD from the Department of Biology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and her postdoctoral fellowship at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Stem Cells Institute, and then finished her postdoctoral training at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. She has been at the forefront of the functional characterization of stem, stemness programs in the human hematopoietic stem cells and how they are perturbed in the leukemia stem cells or LSCs from the acute myeloid leukemia. And also Dr. Sia believes that the understanding of lipid metabolism in stem cells can be very powerful and have great promise to yield strategies for targeting stemness, for improving HSC transplantation and targeting AML. Her presentation title is To Be or Not to Be HSC, A Question of Self-Renewal or Differentiation. Thank you, Dr. Xia. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give uh, this talk. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about these hematopoietic stem cells and their superpower, which is to maintain lifelong uh, blood production in us. And it's really around this axis of self-renewal versus differentiation. And, and uh, in um, the course of, uh, if I can, why can't I make things go? Well, I'll have to go through here. Uh, and in, in uh, so, um, and in, blood is, is a, a very complex cellular hierarchy. And it's really, uh, uh, we can break down to, to uh, a pool of, ver of stem cells that give rise to progenitors that have linear restriction. These stem cells can give rise to everything down here, but once they come here, they're, they're restricted into specific types of blood cells that, they, that can be uh, um, produced. And then from there, uh, mature cells are made. And this is what sustains us um, from, from uh, red blood cells, which is the primary uh, 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 source of, of blood, uh, cells in, in, in your blood. The, in, uh, on, on a uh, daily basis, we're at, at the average person is producing 200 billion red blood cells a day. That's how proliferative the system is, as well as many, many platelets, because really we need to be able to clot and carry oxygen uh, around us. Um, then the, the rest of the mature cells are, are uh, uh, all these particular white blood cells. You've heard a lot about T cells and B cells, as well as our innate immune uh, cells in, in the past year for unfortunate reasons. but, but um, these cells are what really uh, gives us immunity. And, and this process of differentiation really is, is from most of these progenitors. So the cells at the apex, that's what I, uh, I really care about. And these cells are very unique because they have their ability to make themselves as well as make a decision of differentiating down through here. They're very rare. There's only about three to 10,000 cells in an adult human that are long-term hematopoietic stem cells. They're typically quiescent so that uh, at any one point, there's only up to three divisions that, that one of these cells may make. And, and uh, as I said, they, they can be multipotent. Much of what we know about the system uh, was established in, in mouse studies, but I study this exclusively in the human. And today I'm going to tell you two stories in the context of regenerative medicine and, and uh, um, studying the, the, these lipids called sphingolipids and how they, they may have translational implication in, in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, as well as in the context of disease and how the bioactive sphingolipids that can signal to downstream regulators may uh, have, have implications in a disease called acute myeloid leukemia. Um, so, Blood is, is uh, 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 changes in, in the site of, of production from the time when you are uh, uh, embryo through to adult life. And there are uh, additional changes in their proliferative potential and their, um, in, in their lineage restriction their bit and their function. So, so uh, uh, lots of, uh, there are, are many people that focus for instance, in, 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 uh, during fetal life and how, how blood is made from the AGM through to the fetal liver uh, and uh, finally establishing in the bone marrow. And then uh, in adult, uh, uh, this is where the hematopoietic stem cells reside and uh, mature cells will go into the peripheral blood and uh, through to the spleen. So as I said, these cells are, are more proliferative. And as we age, particularly uh, into 65, 
years and older, we, we uh, uh, individuals there show a decrease in, in hematopoietic stem cell function. And some of those decreases and changes will in, uh, 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 lead to an uh, increased risk for leukemia. So this is one of the reasons we really want to understand we under, uh, uh, that the, a lot of these changes at the hematopoietic stem cell level really leads to, to uh, potential disease implications later in life. So understanding this axis is, is very important just to understand how disease may uh, be occurring and to potentially uh, mitigate it. So, but as I said, I, I study uh, uh, um, hematopoietic uh, stem cells only in humans. So it's rather difficult getting cells from here. We can get it from here. And I use sources from, from bone marrow and, and from peripheral blood using a, a agent to mobilize it. But the, primarily I study hematopoietic stem cells by isolating them from umbilical cord blood. When babies are born, we can ask uh, uh, um, individuals to, uh, to have their baby's umbilical cord uh, blood collected and they are sent to our lab. And we can do things where the, to something like this, where we can use high dimensional flow cytometry to isolate individual cells using surface antibodies and, uh, and isolate particular, I add, uh, down to the single cell level, all the long-term stem cells and everything downstream. And then I can use single cell functional assays to ask if it will make a, 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 a myeloid cell or a red blood cell or, or a, a T or B cell. And I can also put those cells into immunocompromised mice and do xenotransplantation assays or with, with manipulations like or, uh, genetically with lentiviruses, for instance, or pharmacologically to really assess HSC function. And uh, uh, moreover, we use things like uh, transcriptional assays where with RNA sequencing or other sorts of assays around, around the DNA, the epigenome that, that some of you may have been learning about and reading about in, in the news in terms of how DNA is folded and what's accessible and, and not accessible. And we, uh, I also use a lot of imaging, both live and fixed cell, to really understand these, uh, uh, what makes really this long-term stem cell, a stem cell. And through that, uh, in the, in the uh, last um, many years in Toronto, I've been part of, of a number of stories that show that uh, the human long-term hematopoietic stem cell is regulated epigenetically and, and some uh, uh, with so what are some of the regulators that, that, that um, makes the stem cell choose to self-renewal or differentiate? Cell cycle regulators, the, 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 um, the proteins that really tell a stem cell to or, and, and regulate that stem cell to stay in that state of quiescence where it's not cycling or to activate, to release it into, into the cell cycle and to, to make more of itself and or to differentiate. And what I'm particularly interested in is, is um, metabolic regulators, these sphingolipids, and how it, they intersect with things like stress response, either either protein stress or infl inflammatory stress to, to uh, uh, decide whether or not it will stay a stem cell or go into the cell cycle and differentiate or self-renewal. So today I'm really going to be talking around two stories here and, and how they intersect with sphingolipids. The first story is, is really around the, um, the unmet need for HSC transplantation donor sources. So in Canada, you can register yourself and I encourage everybody to do so to become a, a, a bone marrow uh, uh, donor. But you see here, in, in the Canadian blood services will only accept bone marrow samples from individuals between 17 and 35 years of age. And in part it's because there, uh, uh, there's a whole body of research around the aging of our stem cells and the potential implications for disease. Although Canada is most restrictive in, in, the, in that age group. In the United States, it goes, uh, um, donors are accepted into their 40s. So, so uh, uh, using uh, uh, 
some of the mechanistic understanding of HSCs that I and others have 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 uh, generated, we can potentially take that into the clinic and to expand donor sources. And one particular don donor source is umbilical cord blood. Um, but in the context of, of, of uh, allergenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which is a curative therapy for uh, leukemia patients, umbilical cord blood is, is uh, uh, there are too few stem cells in there for an adult donor. And, and uh, what's happening is 70% of patients that can qualify for a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for uh, their, their uh, blood diseases actually lack a matched donor. So, so if we can actually make a single uh, donor uh, umbilical cord blood um, unit uh, um, to, to create enough HSCs for, for adult patients, this would, this would uh, uh, be, be really a, a, a life really a game changer in the context of HSC transplantation, particularly for, for individuals who are of, of other uh, non-Caucasian uh, uh, ethnicity. And those that are, are of mixed uh, ethnicity, like my children, who, who are, um, uh, before COVID, they sometimes would come into the lab and help me like for pet tips. So, so really, uh, we understand some, some uh, ways of expanding these uh, umbilical cord blood units with various expansion agents and growth factors, uh, uh, certain cytokines. The problem is when we put HSCs into culture, they lose this critical ability of self-renewal. So if we can understand better what, uh, what maintains self-renewal, maybe we can actually uh, uh, make uh, uh, ex vivo expansion of uh, core blood HSCs more tractable for the clinic. So saying uh, these sphingolipids, uh, uh, many years ago when, when I came to Toronto, I, uh, um, I stumbled really onto the, the fact that these sphingolipids are, are wired differentially between stem and progenitor cells. And these sphingolipids are found throughout the cell um, at, in various organelles at the plasma membrane. They're really uh, complex and and uh, uh, really cool <laughs> uh, if you like uh, biochemistry and whatnot. And they, they are both structural and some of them uh, uh, are, are bioactive, meaning that they can actually activate receptors. And they are found, especially this uh, sphingosine one phosphate throughout our blood and circulate and, and um, do many, many things. They uh, affect many uh, uh, functions, everything from proliferation to migration, particularly of our, of our T cells, this process of autophagy that I'm gonna uh, go into a little bit. And, and in the context of, of various diseases, including tumor genesis, um, the, 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 um, the normal uh, rhyostat of, of certain sphingolipid species with, with this bioactive lipid species gets altered and that uh, has implications for disease. So as I was saying, when I, um, uh, when I first started studying hemat um, hematopoietic stem cells in the human system, uh, comparing it to progenitor populations, I noticed that that number of uh, uh, sphingolipid enzymes, as well as other lipid enzymes and regulators were expressed differently between the, these stem cells and the, and the progenitors. And, and um, and, and I overlaid it onto, in, in the case of sphingolipids, onto the metabolic pathway. Now, the reason I chose to look at sphingolipids is there's a lot of, of knowledge around the biochemistry of, of this pathway. And there are many small molecule inhibitors throughout this, this uh, uh, um, metabolic pathway. And one of them targets this, this gene, a desaturase um, that, all it does is, is uh, uh, converts this thing called dihydroceramide and gives it a double bond. But that, it, that completely changes the structure of, of these uh, two uh, lipid species. And what I found and long or short of it is if I add an inhibitor to that, that, that enzyme called DEGS1 during uh, culture of, of core blood uh, stem cells, 
and expand them. If I put them into a xenotransplant, uh, into a mouse uh, for xenotransplantation, wait until the only cells that can give rise to all the, the human blood that's there uh, are coming from the long-term stem cells for 16 weeks, take those cells out again, and then serial transplant. This is our gold standard assay. If a cell can, uh, can make blood again in another mouse, or if we could do in the context of humans and we do make another, uh, make a, a blood system again, then it must be a stem cell. We can do it in such a way that we can uh, quantitatively uh, uh, um, figure out the stem cell frequency. And when, when I did this, what I found were, was that the, the cells that were treated with 4-HPR and being here are, are, uh, have an increased uh, stem cell frequency, meaning that in the culture process, before they went into the mice, I was retaining self-renewal by inhibiting this, this lipid enzyme. All it does is change it by putting a double bond. And so why is this the case? Well, many, you don't need to know the background, like it took actually a, 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 a year or two to figure out. But um, what we do know is, is, is that uh, uh, part of the way uh, a hematopoietic stem cell maintains homeostasis of the blood system through life is, is all around its ability to respond to stress. And if there's, a uh, really strong stress, like DNA damage. You don't want that, uh, that stem cell that has the ability to make several hundred million cells a day. And it has a mutation to spread to all its, all its daughters and, and uh, other cells downstream. So you wanna kill that cell if, if, uh, uh, if it has, has a, a mutation. So in the context of things like DNA damage response, the, uh, the hematopoietic stem cell has the ability to sense it and kill that cell. But under weak stressors, the normal effects of putting a cell, uh, asking a cell to go into the cell cycle and make another copy of itself and uh, through, through the process of what we call mitosis to make one cell from one cell to two, there are just normal everyday little stressing, stressors associated with metabolism, making the DNA and whatnot. Well, this hematopoietic stem cell has, has some superpowers around increased self-renewal related to that. And it has these, these um, pathways um, called the integrated stress response for instance, and this, this process of autophagy where it can actually eat uh, bits of itself to help it help the cell survive these weak stressors. So that's what we uh, what I found when cells were tr were treated with this this molecule called ferentanil 4-HPR that blocks this Degs1 enzyme. It's activating uh, autophagy. It's activating this pro survival stress response, and it's leading to increased autophagy. It's just a, a, a amino staining for for a particular um, molecule called LC32 that, that we use to assay for, for autophagy. And so, so in this first story, what uh, uh, I'm really relating to you is that when uh, just understanding some basic uh, uh, mechanisms of what makes a hematopoietic uh, stem cell, stem cell in the context of this, this uh, metabolic stress uh, stressor, I've, uh, uh, I've conveyed that, that, that uh, we can potentially add this molecule in, and there are many other, uh, other expan expansion agents, and, and in the context of the story I did so, which really increases this uh, self-renewal ability, and we are in, in the process with uh, some companies and uh, other gene therapy uh, 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 collaborators to really take this, hopefully, to the, the clinic. So uh, to switch gears, I'm gonna now talk about um, why understanding the normal hematopoietic hierarchy may have uh, implications for uh, the 
uh, disease context, like this this uh, 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 cancer called acute myeloid leukemia, where it's it's uh, really known to be a stem cell disease, where uh, its ability to to differentiate has has gone askew, and it uh, uh, is uh, has impaired myeloid differentiation. And similar to the normal blood hierarchy, there is some sort of hierarchy with these leukemic stem cells or LSCs. They're highly heterogeneous um, and they give rise to some poor progenitors. And then the, uh, those cells become blasts that have uncontrolled growth. They never fully differentiate. And that really uh, is the problem. And then these individuals um, can, can, can respond to, there's chemotherapy. Unfortunately, especially, and this is really more of a disease of the elderly, and the older you are, the less you will, will respond to chemotherapy. And, you will, and many of these individuals relapse. And, and when they relapse, we don't really have many options to treat these, these individuals. But what we do know is that that relapse often uh, comes from these leukemic stem cells. And that stemness at the, at the uh, transcription level, that means that the RNA molecules that are made and, and, and that, that become proteins is prognostic. We have some ways of looking at uh, the, the various individuals with AML. And that uh, allows us to really uh, potentially take some of that more and more into the clinic to, to realize some personalized medicine for AML patients. Uh, this is very important because AML is, is highly heterogeneous, both between patients and within a single individual. And some of that is associated in, as I said, in the context of, of aging. And in aging, we also know that this process of inflammation that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, plays a role to potentially take a normal blood system and, and with chronic inflammation can uh, lead to, under certain mutations and, and, and alterations in an uh, uh, in, uh, individual, will t lead to, to creating a blood disease in some individuals. What we know is that uh, sphingolipids, um, the, especially the sphingosine 1-phosphate, these, these bioactive lipids, are, are um, Associated with inflammation and and uh, and aging and 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 at the at the plasma level in certain tissues, we see uh, 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 various scientists have shown that there's an alteration of of uh, uh, sphingolipid levels, um, particularly in the context of of, uh, 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 of diseases associated with inflammation like diabetes and heart disease as well as leukemia. So in this second story, what I found was one of these receptors that bind to, to sphingosine one phosphate called uh, sphingosine one phosphate receptor three or S1PR3 really responds to uh, inflammatory cytokines and um, can promote differentiation. This was just published uh, uh, a few months ago. And the, um, the story really starts at the, at the level of looking at uh, gene, uh, 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 RNA expression, gene expression of uh, uh, the some of the genes that that are associated with um, the the uh, signaling process, the receptors and some of the enzymes that make or break this uh, uh, S1P. And what I uh, found was S1PR3 is only expressed in granulocytes and monocytes. So this is all associative. What what then I sh went to show is that this receptor is absent on on the surface of hematopoietic stem cells, but if you uh, treat them with uh, with uh, um, inflammatory cytokine like TNF alpha, you can make. Uh, these HSCs ex express them on the surface. If you overexpress this receptor and force the stem cells to, to, uh, to have this receptor, that will activate the entire TNF alpha via NF kappa B pathway, as well as tons of other inflammatory pathway. And ultimately it leads to myeloid differentiation. And why this was very interesting to me is that if we look in, Many a, uh, AML uh, gene sets. Here are th there are three of them, and we know some things about. Uh, and uh, each of these little lines here uh, are patients, and and uh, using uh, 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 some bioinformatic tools, we we know that if uh, some of these patients are very 
STEM-like. They they look like uh, more like uh, they're uh, like a uh, HSC progenitor like situation. Some of them are very more mature looking, although they are, they are diseased. They are, they they resemble a more uh, normal myeloid cell. And what happens in these patients is that those that are more myeloid have higher expression of the S1PR3. And if you go into, we have uh, tools of separating in, in patients and, and, and figuring out where we're uh, within the, the disease cells. Some of those are le more um, leukemic stem cell-like that this also still uh, holds that S1PR3 is basically marking some patients and a subset of cells in those patients that have this inflammatory signature. And, and so why is, uh, is this interesting? How can it, it potentially have a therapeutic uh, um, potential? Well, what we found is that in, in hematopoietic stem cells, if we overexpress this receptor, let's see, uh, this is live cell uh, uh, imaging over, over several days, um, the cells that have S1PR3 have been forced to express S1PR3 divide a lot faster. But on top of that, they die less. So what I think is the case is in the context of a normal uh, hematopoietic stem cell, the reason why this pathway is there is, is to uh, allow the hematopoietic stem cell to respond to that stress, survive the stress, give rise to, to, to uh, blood that will have more myeloid cells so the innate immune system will, will respond to, this, to, to the, uh, the infection and inflammation and then go back and survive through and then it can go back to a homeostatic situation. But in the context of, of uh, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, some of the patients have really upregulated it. Uh, uh, and 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 it may be to, to for for the survival mechanism, um, but if if uh, if it's there, and you make the the AML cells over, uh, uh, express more of it than is actually they're comfortable with, basically, it will it will uh, cause a situation where they differentiate. And if, if I take it away, I can do so with an antagonist, a, a pharmacological agent that blocks the ability of the receptor to work, or, or uh, uh, use a knockdown technology and, 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 um, and make, this, make the uh, certain AML cells express left, uh, less of it. We can toggle differentiation up or down. And if cells are differentiating, these AML cells are differentiating, then they can't sustain disease as much. This is all around TNF-alpha, uh, uh, using various uh, experiments in the lab. So what I think it, it happens in the context of a leukemic stem cell is, is uh, it's upregulated a bit of S1PR3 to, to, uh, uh, for survival. But if you really activate this pathway, you could potentially lead to differentiation. And this could be a tool to, to uh, uh, eradicate the disease. So uh, what, uh, uh, what is out there is in the context of a disease called multiple sclerosis, which is a neuroinflammatory disease involving uh, uh, T cells. Um, uh, there, there, uh, uh, there is a, a drug called fingolima or made by Pfizer. It's in the clinic, it's called Gylenia, and that can target a, a number of these S1P receptors, including S1PR3. And what I then did was using our xenotransplantation system, took patient AMLs or some normal stem cells, put them into mice, treat them with this FTY720 for a few weeks, look at the primary uh, uh, transplant, the, the, the human cells that are in the, either in the context of disease or normal, found that some of these patients will uh, respond just in that case. And the, uh, and the, the cells in, re in red that got treated with FTY720, there's less engraftment. So some of uh, the, uh, so that's really nice, but it's, it's quite modest. There's only three of them. When I take some of those cells that were only treat it in the transplant and put them into the secondary, then I can assay for leukemic stem cell function. And what I found was that in, uh, in many of these patients, there's a decrease in LSC frequency uh, and the, there's no effect on, on normal cells. So that means that there's a therapeutic window where maybe this drug that is, uh, is already in a clinic for multiple sclerosis could be 
utilized for subsets of AML patients as, as a, a treatment option. So in this second story, what, what I uh, told you is that uh, through this bioactive lipid signaling, maybe there's a possibility for differentiation uh, induction as, as a therapy uh, and, and to take these, these impaired myeloid differentiated cells in the context of AML and really push them to differentiate. Um, and so uh, I like to thank uh, lots of people, um, John uh, Dick, especially, who has been my mentor for many years, and I'm still embedded as a, the independent scientist in his lab. A um, lot of uh, folks who help uh, me um, with these projects, collaborators throughout the world, and many students, uh, many of them undergraduates through the years, including Daria, who, who has been brave enough through COVID to, to uh, uh, work with me on some new projects that uh, uh, hopefully you'll see the light of day in the next year or two. And uh, all the lab members in my family and, and uh, uh, this beautiful city of Toronto that has allowed us to bike around and, and survive COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very fascinating presentation, Dr. Sia. I loved how your study, um, I loved your study on finding the relationship between the HSCs and the acute myeloid leukemia. And it was also very promising to listen on how the lipid enzyme can actually target stemness. So thank you so much, Dr. Stephanie Sia. So um, this is all, this is um, the presentation from Dr. Dr. Sia. However, you'll be able to hear more from her during the panelists' formal networking session. So we will now redesignate you to attendee, Dr. Sia. Thank you so much for today. Thank you for having me. So uh, before starting our last presentation with Dr. Gilbert, just a reminder that we do have two sessions running simultaneously from our research hall, um, which is at the bioethics and also the law and business hall at the moment. So you guys can check those out. But um, I also think that you guys don't want to miss Dr. Um, Gilbert's presentation. So um, we will now have um, Dr. Gil Gilbert, who was also our judge for the research competition um, later um, in, the pre in the beginning of um, the afternoon. Um, and she will be our final uh, breakout session speaker. So Dr. Gilbert, uh, you are already promote promoted to the panelists. So um, Dr. Emily Gilbert, um, which PhD, is also as a regenerative neurobiologist and a current postdoctoral fellow at the Marshad Lab at the Donnelly Center for Cellular and Biomolecular Research. So she completed her graduate training in biomedical sciences at the University of Guelph. And during her PhD, she investigated the role of neural stem and progenitor cells during tell regeneration in the leopard gecko. Specifically, her study explores the role of stem cells in the spontaneous spinal cord regeneration and repair. In 2017, Dr. Gilbert began her postdoctoral training at the University of Toronto. Her current work aims to enhance the response of resi resident neural stem and progenitor cells and improve structural and functional recovery following a range of injuries within the central nervous system, including the spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis. Her presentation title is Stem Cells Online, Lizards, Mice, Spinal Cords, and Stem Cells. Thank you, thank you Dr. Emily Gilbert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk today. I attended the conference last year as well, and I was really inspired by the enthusiasm of the entire group. And I just want to thank the organizing committee because I know this is a huge undertaking, especially in this virtual format. And I think you guys have done an amazing job putting all these pieces together. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it all right? Yep, perfect. Okay. So I've entitled my talk today, Lizards, Mice, Spinal Cords, and Stem Cells. And what I thought I would do, because I know that it's a largely high school and undergrad audience, um, is I would try to give some background on the science, but also on my path and, and the trajectory of my research um, over, I guess, the last 10 years or so throughout my, my graduate school and my postdoc. Um, because I think the most common question that that we get at especially that I got last year at this conference was just how do you get sort of from A to B and how do your studies work together. Um, so broadly speaking today what I want to talk about is understanding how endogenous or resident neural stem cells so those already present in the body 
can be used to promote repair within the central nervous system. So this is the brain and the spinal cord. And so today what I wanna focus on is spinal cord regeneration in lizards um, and how these studies uh, in a species that can spontaneously regenerate their spinal cord have really helped to drive my research and inform more translational or bench to bedside studies in mammals. So I'm gonna start with just a brief overview of my background. Um, so during my undergrad and during my master's degree, I worked in an embryonic chick model, which is what you can see pictured here on the left. And I studied the development of a structure known as the cerebellum. And within the cerebellum, I focused on Purkinje cells. So these are these beautiful cells shown here on the right. Um, and they're critical for function of this structure. And so my early work focused on how these cells develop in chicks versus how they develop in mice. And so this work led to the idea that the development of CNS structures varies in its timing depending on the necessity of the species to be independent at birth. And so over the course of time, although I no longer work on the cerebellum directly, this developmental background has been really cool in, in connecting development to regeneration because one of the main ways that, that we think regeneration could be occurring in species is through a redeployment of developmental programs. So whether it be patterning, activation of stem cells or, or signaling between structures. And so from here, I moved on to a very cool lab at the University of Guelph that is run by Dr. Matthew Vicarious. And uh, Dr. Vicarious pioneered the use of the leopard gecko to study multi-tissue regeneration. And so when I joined this lab, I was really interested in understanding how the spinal cord regenerates in these guys. So um, his lab described the process, but hadn't specifically looked at individual structures. And so with my central nervous system background, I took on um, exploring and describing how stem cells are activated and respond to generate new neurons and glial cells in, in the leopard gecko. And so then uh, from there, I moved to the University of Toronto for my postdoctoral training and I shifted to a mammalian model. So I've gone from embryonic chicks to lizards and now to a mammalian mouse model. And my work in the Morse head lab uses these same principles of um, studying endogenous neural stem cells to try to activate their response in mammals, in essence, making them more like regeneration competent lizards um, to improve functional outcomes. And today I'm gonna to show you some data from those studies as well. Um, showing how we've actually repurposed a type two diabetes medication to enhance the activation of stem cells and also enhance functional recovery in a mouse model. So I divided up my approach to understanding uh, regeneration and stem cells, which I think is really at the core of, of today's conference into sort of three key tenants. And so the first of those is the idea of defining the requirements for regeneration. And so I think that studying stem cells and regeneration in species that can regenerate really allows us to define what we need for successful spinal cord regeneration, uh, brain regeneration, could be muscle regeneration, um, really any tissue in the body that you can imagine. I think understanding the mechanisms um, and defining the requirements is really critical. And then the second thing is establishing the barriers to regeneration. So one of the really cool things about working in a species that can regenerate um, is that instead of trying to take away barriers, we can, we can sort of singly add a barrier. So something like inflammation and establish whether that inhibits regeneration from occurring. So it allows us to really examine it, examine limiting factors in regeneration. And then sort of the one thing that probably drives all of this is the idea of understanding the mechanisms. So using these species and comparing the similarities and differences between them and mammals um, to understand the mechanisms by which cells are replaced 
and function is reestablished within the central nervous system microenvironment, especially after injury. And I think that really taking a step back and understanding these mechanisms is really important for directing future therapeutic treatments. So what I thought I would do is first go through some models of CNS regeneration. Um, and so here, what we're looking at is a phylogeny. Um, and so the best way to follow this is to start at the top of the phylogeny. And so at the top here, you have mammals and you have birds and you have lizards. And these guys as a group are known as amniotes. And then equally related to all uh, amniotes is a second group known as amphibians, and this includes axolotls, which you've probably heard of as like the superheroes of regeneration. They're, they have amazing regenerative uh, capacity, as well here as uh, anurans or xenopus or frogs, which can also regenerate. And then down here we have teleost fish, um, so goldfish as well as zebrafish. And so when we look at regeneration across these groups, when we look at, uh, at fish at the bottom, these guys can regenerate a complete spinal cord following transection, just six weeks following injury. When we move up and look at amphibians, so the uridials uh, and the anurans, these guys are probably the most impressive regenerators. So they can regenerate the spinal cord, the soft tissues, um, as well as vertebrae following injury. And then when we look within amniotes, so amniotes are defined as lizards, birds, and mammals. Really lizards show the most comprehensive regenerative abilities and they're capable of regenerating a uh, multi-tissue tail following a process known as autotomy or tail loss. And so this close relationship to mammals is really what I think makes them an amazing comparative model to look at and something that I, I wanted to introduce to you today. Okay, so here's a leopard gecko. So these guys, while well, he looks giant on the slide here, can fit in the palm of your hand. As I've said, they can spontaneously regenerate their tail. The regenerate tail is a functional multi-tissue structure and I'll show you what the inside of that looks like in a few slides. And as I've also mentioned, they're the closest relatives of mammals that are capable of spinal cord regeneration. And so one of the really cool things about this model is that we can study the process of regeneration without any sort of surgical uh, intervention at all because they have evolved the ability to drop their tails through a process known as autotomy in response to a predation threat. And so I'm gonna show you a quick video here. So just to orient everyone to this video, you have the hind legs of the gecko here, the tails in the middle, and you can see my fingers are gonna pinch the tail. And so when you watch this video, what you'll see is that the spinal cord is uh, torn, exposed to the external environment, and then the actual tail that's lost is gonna thrash around, detract, distract the predator, and the gecko will actually escape without harm. So you can see here, you pinch, and you can see the tail drops off. There's minimal blood loss. And here you can see the tail actually moves around through its nervous system innervation. And if you look right in the middle here, you can see the spinal cord itself. So a pretty amazing naturally occurring process that then allows us to study the naturally occurring stem cell response after injury. And so just to give you an idea of how this regeneration process occurs. So here you're looking at the end of the tail in a time course of images from three hours up to 12 days following injury. So you can see immediately after injury, the entire basically cross section of the tail is exposed. You get a clot that forms at around uh, 12 hours. It lasts until about four days. It then falls off and you see this really shiny new wound epithelium. And then deep to that wound epithelium, you have the proliferation of new cells which eventually make up um, the regenerate spinal cord. And within that population of new proliferating cells, you have tissue specific stem cells 
that help to make muscle um, as well as skin, as well as the spinal cord or central nervous system. And so this occurs through a process known as epimorphic regeneration, which is defined as the replacement of complex structures through the mediation of a blastema. And a blastema is this structure you can see in the image here protruding from the site of tail loss. And so when we look at these images here, so these are histological panels of the tail throughout different stages. Um, so here, when you look early, this is immediately following tail loss. And so just to orient everyone to these images, on the outside here, you have the skin, then you have the muscle, you then have adipose or fat tissue, you have the vertebra, you have this spinal cord shown here in the middle, and then it repeats on the other side. And so one of the things that really intrigued me about the spinal cord in the context of regeneration is that when you look at this group of proliferating stem cells known as the blastema, what you see is that the first evidence of them occurs just distal to the original spinal cord. And so I've hatched that out shown here with the black hatched lines. And you can see that this expands dramatically uh, throughout the course of regeneration. But regardless of whether it's early regeneration or late regeneration, you can see that the spinal cord, so you can see if you look at these bottom panels, protrudes into the differentiating tissue and appears to sort of direct the process. Um, and so one of the reasons that I was drawn to spinal cord regeneration is because we know that it's actually required for regeneration of all of the other tissues during this process. And further to that, it's so powerful in its support of regeneration that splitting the spinal cord in half actually can result in two regenerate tails. And so I'm gonna show you some very old school images from one of my favorite regeneration papers where they actually uh, cut open the skin. They then bisected the spinal cord um, at the tip of the, or at the base of the tail and when they split it, they got one regenerate tail that formed normally and another one that protruded outwards. And you can see that that uh, differentiated into a second tail just based on the power of the spinal cord itself. So I was pretty compelled by this and spent my time in the lab trying to understand the stem cell based mechanisms by which regeneration of the gecko spinal cord occurs. And so I think this has really important implications for mammalian regeneration, in part because the structure is identical in its makeup of three key layers, whether you're looking at a lizard spinal cord or a mouse spinal cord. And so when you look at the original spinal cord in the gecko, you can see that there's three key layers. There's this outer layer of white matter. And within this layer of white matter, we have myelinated axons that run up along the tail, they connect to the brain, and they also project out to the limbs and all parts of the body and are essential for, for functioning in, in every possible way. Deep to that, we have a layer known as the gray matter. And then deep to that, we have this area known as the periventricular zone. And the periventricular zone is the zone where the neural stem cells reside within the lizard spinal cord and also excitingly where they reside within the mammalian spinal cord. And then what I think is even cooler is that when you look at the regenerate spinal cord in a lizard, it's not identical um, to the original, but rather it's an expanded version of this periventricular zone, which is significantly larger. You can see from this image on the right. And then around it is a layer of myelinated axons shown with the green staining and hatched in the yellow line. And so my work went on to show that really the success of spinal cord regeneration in lizards um, hinged on a few key things. So one, a muted inflammatory response. Two, and probably most importantly, was the activation of neural stem and progenitor cells. 
and then three, the differentiation of those neural stem cells into mature neurons and oligodendrocytes. And so I think one of the really, really uh, striking things here is that, as I've told you, when we look across other vertebrate species, such as fish, uridials, and as I've just shown you, lizards, we see that they are capable of regenerating their spinal cord through structural and functional restoration, but mammals are not. So they have no restoration of the spinal cord following injury. But across all of these species, neural stem and progenitor cells are activated following injury. And so this now segues into my research uh, in the Morsehead Lab at the University of Toronto, um, where I really look at NSPCs and activating their, their, res their response and changing their response in a mammalian model. So just to give everyone a bit of a background on neural stem and progenitor cells. So as I've already told you, they're located in this periventricular zone. So in this image, that's the pink area. We know that these cells express stem cell markers. So specific markers you can use to identify them include things like SOX2 or Nestin, as well as GFAP. Within the spinal cord, we know that neural stem and progenitor cells are largely quiescent or inactive, but we know that they're activated following injury. And we also know that if we take these stem cells out of the mammalian system and culture them in a dish and then drive them to differentiate, they are multipotent and can make all the cells of the central nervous system, including neurons, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes. But as I've told you, this NSPC response is insufficient for repair or recovery following spinal cord injury. And so my work in the lab really focuses on activating endogenous NSPCs and promoting self-repair. And so the basis of this is that lizard work that's really shown how important they are and now we're trying to translate that into a non-invasive mammalian model. And so I've broken this up here into three key objectives that I'm gonna go through and, and describe with you today. The first of which is the goal of expanding the NSPC pool. So making the response of the stem cells more robust in a mammal with the idea that they can then go on and improve uh, regenerative potential or functional recovery. The second is to promote or control their differentiation into neurons and oligodendrocytes. And so the idea here is to promote differentiation into the cells that are really most fundamental for the transmission of signals within the spinal cord. And then the third and arguably most important thing is establishing whether this expansion in the NSPC pool, as well as their promotion of the promotion of their differentiation into neurons and oligodendrocytes can actually drive and improve functional recovery. And so the way that we're focused on doing this in the lab is through a drug known as metformin. So metformin is a drug most commonly used uh, as a type two diabetes medication where it works by decreasing glucose production in the liver and increasing the insulin sensitivity of body tissues. But what's really exciting is that over the past two years, it's been shown to have profound effects in the brain. So within the brain, it's been shown to expand the NSPC pool, enhance differentiation of neurons and oligodendrocytes, as well as improve memory uh, and functional recovery and also modulate inflammation but its effects had never been explored within the spinal cord. And so the first thing that we wanted to do in the lab was to look at whether we could treat with metformin to expand the NSPC pool. And so we did this using a really cool assay known as the neurosphere assay, where you can dissect the periventricular zone, so that's that area shown in pink, out of the spinal cord you can then plate these cells in specific growth factors, including uh, epidermal growth factor and fibroblast growth factor. 
you can then leave them in culture for seven days and any of the stem cells that are present in that original dissection will form a colony known as a neurosphere. And then you can count the number of neurospheres and each neurosphere then represents the presence of one stem cell. And so in this experiment, we treated mice in vivo through injections for seven days with metformin. We then performed the neurosphere assay on day seven. We dissected out that periventricular zone, waited seven more days, and then we counted the number of neurospheres across animals who'd been treated with vehicle as well as those treated with metformin. So if you look on the bottom panel here, you can see at the pink arrows, this is what a neurosphere looks like. And when we count them, we see that there are significantly more neurospheres formed in animals that were treated with metformin. We can then go on and look at whether uh, metformin can promote differentiation. So this again is that idea of driving the production of neurons and oligodendrocytes, which are the cells responsible for signal transmission in the cord. And so in a similar experiment, we dissected out the periventricular zone, plated the cells down. We then uh, took those neurospheres, we plated them down individually and we switched them into differentiation conditions and allowed them to differentiate into mature cells for seven days. We then fixed them and we can stain them for markers specific to different cells within the central nervous system. So we can use a marker known as GFAP to look at astrocytes. We looked at a marker known as uh, O4 to mark oligodendrocytes and TUJ1 to look at neurons. And then we can compare across our vehicle and metformin treated groups, how the differentiation profile changes. So the first thing that we had to do was show that uh, these spheres were in fact multipotent and generated astrocytes, oligodendrocytes and neurons. And so you can see in this image here in green, we have astrocytes, which are the most um, prevalent support cells in the central nervous system. In red, you can see these highly branched oligodendrocytes, which are really critical for myelination. And then in pink, you can see the neurons, which are the signal conducting cells within the spinal cord. And so what was really cool is that when we looked at these spheres, we saw that when we plated them in the presence of metformin, we had a promotion of oligogenesis. So we had significantly more oligos formed from spheres that contained, uh, from spheres that were treated with metformin. And so then considering these effects, so we have expansion in the number of cells and we also have enhanced oligogenesis. I should also say we also have results showing enhanced neurogenesis, but just for the, uh, for the purposes of time, I'm not gonna show it today. Um, but based on these three findings, we wanted to go on and see whether metformin would improve recovery following spinal cord injury. And so in this model, we performed functional testing prior to injury on day zero. We then gave them a spinal cord injury on day one. It's a minimally invasive spinal cord injury, which is basically a needle track injury into that white matter or that myelinated area. So it's a needle track injury in the dorsal cord. We then evaluated their motor function at seven days and again at 14 days and treated them with either metformin or a vehicle, which was saline. And then to evaluate this, we use a task known as the horizontal ladder. And so this is a raised ladder with unevenly spaced rungs. The mice walk across these ladders and we can count the total number of steps and then count the total number of slips as a way to evaluate the function of their spinal cord after, before and after injury. And so when you look at the results, so just to orient everyone to this graph, on the y-axis, we have the percent hind slips and on the x-axis, we have the time points. So baseline, post-injury day seven, and post-injury day 14. So if you look at the green line, you can see that these animals, so our sham animals who had no injury at all, 
rarely slip at all across any of our time points, which is what we would expect. When we look at our SCI animals, so our animals that received a spinal cord injury but didn't get metformin treatment, you can see that at seven days, they show a significant deficit that persists until post-injury day 14. And when we treat them with metformin, what's most exciting is that while they do show a deficit on post-injury day seven, by post-injury day 14, they're not significantly impaired and have recovered function compared to those guys who just received vehicle treatment. And so I just have a few conclusions here and then I'm happy to take any questions. Um, so this work to date has shown that metformin can expand the NSPC pool in the spinal cord, enhance oligogenesis and improve functional outcome following spinal cord injury. And also that metformin is a potential therapeutic strategy for enhancing neural repair and improving recovery following SCI. And I just want to quickly bring it back to this idea of, um, of the, the leopard gecko as a model for informing this. It's really those, those principles shown in those models that can regenerate their spinal cord that help to drive and direct this research um, in ways that we know are meaningful in, in the context of spinal cord regeneration. And so with that, I have a few acknowledgments. Uh, I'd really like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to give this talk, as well as funding from uh, Wings for Life, as well as American Association of Anatomists, as well as members of the Morsehead Lab, um, and the undergraduate students who have worked on this project. And now I'm very happy to take any questions you might have relating to either the research, uh, the, the path I took, or, or any other questions you have. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, Dr. Gilbert. I love seeing all of the different animal models in your PowerPoint presentation. And I also thought that the ability to get spinal cord regeneration in the three animal models was really fascinating. So now um, for the attendees, if you guys can put your questions in the chat um, or raise your hands um, to directly um, speak to Dr. Emily Gilbert about your questions. If there aren't questions right now, we do have uh, pre-collected questions. So question one is, yep. what are some applications of the knowledge learned from animal models, such as the lizard tail generation, sorry, regeneration in treating human ne neurodegenerative diseases, such as maybe dementia and Alzheimer's? Sure. So I think, um, I think the most important thing is to really understand that the use of those models is understanding the mechanisms behind stem cell mediated uh, regeneration. And so I think one of the challenges with some of the research or the, the majority of research going on today is we're so quick to take stem cells, we know how to culture them and manipulate them in a dish, and we throw them in, into a mammalian system and, and expect to get these really compelling outcomes. But I think the challenge is we're not getting those compelling outcomes that we, that we see in species that can regenerate. So my, my sort of feeling on, on the, the approach is that if we take a step back and say, this is what the stem cells look like, act like, these are the factors that they release, and this is the environment in which they exist in. If we have more information on that, then we can manipulate the mammalian environment or the mammalian cells to be more regeneration-like. Um, so I love the idea of using these comparative studies. So doing things like single cell sequencing of a neural stem cell in a lizard and a mouse and pulling out, you know, there's 10 things about them that are the same and there's five things that are different. And those five things then become the targets to enhance mammalian regeneration. So make them more lizard-like and, and see what happens. Um, I think it's the idea of taking a step back and understanding more of the basic biology before we sort of forge ahead with these really high throughput expensive mammalian studies. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Gilbert. Um, neurodegenerative disorders are also not very fully determined um, within their molecular um, mechanisms. So yeah. I to totally agree with um, you, um, your uh, instance on talking about how we should understand the mechanisms first before applying all of these crazy, um, also quite expensive um, me methods. Yeah, so, and I, uh, you know, they're not all crazy. I, I think it's more the idea that I like to sort of say we need to learn from the experts. So these other species are the experts at regeneration, and yet we're miles behind in understanding how they do it. So my agenda is to sort of push push a basic understanding to better inform the translational studies. Yeah, totally agree. Thank you. So we do have questions in the chat right now. So okay. um, what, a question from John is, do you think uh, uh, met uh, Foreman, I think uh, he was talking about, could lead to a cure for paralysis sometime in the future, or do you think that it would take another approach? So I think that all of these treatments are powerful in, in what they can do, but I think probably the reality of the situation is that we need more than one thing. So the idea of a, a combination treatment. So metformin, we know in the spinal cord is powerful at activating the stem cells as well as modulating inflammation. And it's also a, a safe drug that is used often. So, you know, I think that it, it has a place at enhancing repair, but I don't think that it's the kind of thing where I envision it as a part of a strategy instead of being like a magic bullet, if that makes sense. So there are clinical trials actually, um, using metformin for brain injury that have shown promising effects in children. Um, but again, these are a part of a complex strategy and, and it's not for me gonna be a, a single thing that changes something like paralysis. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is kind of related to um, the um, answer you just gave. So did the use of metformin pose any short-term or long-term safety risks to the trial subjects? So there have not been any adverse effects described in these trials to date. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. Um, so another question from Yazin. So do we uh, know how metformin promotes NPSC proliferation mechanic mechanistically? Um, is the pathway known already or not? So um, there Metformin seems to be quite complicated in how it works in the central nervous system. So it works through uh, the TAP73 pathway to drive differentiation. It works through the CBP pathway to drive um, expansion. And it works through the NF kappa B pathway to modulate inflammation. So we do know, but we know that it has a diverse signaling portfolio. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question um, from like previously collected and sure. I'll read that. So is there an evolutionary explanation as to why not all species are capable of regeneration to the extent that some lizards can, for example? Yeah, so this is one of my favorite questions. It's an excellent question. I think that the simple answer to this, and it's not the full answer, but the simple answer to this is that there is a trade-off. So for whatever reason, we had to trade off the ability to regenerate for something more pressing. So how I best describe this is that in the case of a brain injury or a spinal cord injury, how we've evolved to handle that is to seal off the wound to, to stop further spread. And that makes sense, right? We have big brains, we have complex spinal cords. And so for us, it's just like seal it off. It is what it is. And we're going to just, and we're just going to try to minimize the injury that could be to do with brain and spinal cord complexity. Um, but that doesn't mean that the cells don't exist with the potential to do it. It just means that our naturally occurring process doesn't allow for it. Whereas in a lizard, they didn't have to lose that for anything else. So it, yeah, it's, it's, it's that thing of, of, you know, people always say to me, oh, but mammals are, mammals are here. And all of those are like lower vertebrates. And I would challenge the, the concept of that. Cause I would say we're, 
we're here for so many things, but when it comes to something like regeneration, we lost that ability and they've maintained that ability. I think that's also the reason why we're um, not only studying human um, humans, but we're also studying animals to kind of um, regain the instance of how their mechanism works and maybe apply it to humans later on. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, <laughs> you could ask the question a million different ways and there's so many papers out there that sort of try to figure out where regeneration was lost and it's, it's not clear cut, but it's a great question. Thank you. Oh, so uh, unfortunately with the time's sake, this will be our last question from the chat. So hi, Dr. Gilbert, um, could you elaborate on why you think functional recovery was possible? And would that not require massive reorganization of the motor pathways? So, uh, so I would say um, functional recovery was probably possible because of a few things. So one, enhanced neural stem cells, two, enhanced myelination, and also three, this idea of reduced inflammation. And so there have been studies showing that all you need is a 5% change in something in the environment or the stem cells to drive functional recovery. So I think we have to think about these things not as yes or no, but that there's a spectrum of recovery. And so I think for someone who's afflicted with a spinal cord injury, you know, 5% better is a lot. And so what I would say is all of those things are, are driving recovery. It's not, it's not one single thing, but I certainly think it's an interplay between the stem cells and the environment and something about metformin is changing that. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilbert. I'll um, so that, um, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for Dr. Gilbert's Q&A session. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilbert, for your wonderful presentation with all the cute uh, uh, animal models <laughs> and also um, the, uh, your insightful answers for the questions. Um, and this concludes our presentations during the breakout session for the research hall. And on the behalf of the SSSCR team, I would like to thank Dr. Markin, Dr. Gilbert, and Dr. CA for your dedicated efforts for the conference. And a quick reminder that um, attendees are welcome to, welcomed and encouraged to switch through sessions during the formal networking to ask questions and listen. And so I would now like to give the moderator role to Siwu, um, who will be guiding the attendees and the panelists throughout the paneling for formal networking session. Thank you so much. Yes, sorry, just a quick reminder that we will have a quick uh, break and we will be starting the formal networking session at 3.50. See you guys then. A speaker said this, and so actually it's two parts. The first one is, I think especially in undergrad and early during grad school, any opportunity that comes your way, um, whether that's giving a talk that you feel a little bit intimidated to give or attending a networking session, doing things like this, take every single opportunity you have to do those things. Because I think the practice of taking opportunities and running with them, you never know where they're going to lead um, or who you're going to meet during that time. So I think the idea of just saying, you know what, I'm going to turn my phone off and I'm going to do this and I'm going to be 100% there. I think early in, in undergrad, especially when it's really easy to, to sort of fade into the background, if you just, if you take opportunities as they come, regardless of whether you see an immediate um, reward in that, um, I would, I would do it. And then the second thing I would say um, is, is a piece of advice I got in a separate part of my life. So when I'm not in the lab, I, I horseback ride. Uh, and it's like my side passion that I do more than I probably should, but it's a good balance to research. And uh, the coach of the Canadian team had a, had a networking session similar to this one 
And he said, whatever you do, wherever you go, surround yourself with exceptional people. Uh, So people that care about mentoring and supporting one another. Um, And so I think that that would be the other part of my advice. So surround yourself with those people. If you don't feel like you're around those people, be brave enough to seek those people out, reach out to people like us in these networking sessions. And, And I think those two things are our advice I would give myself then and and still do sometimes. So maybe I could go, because I want to pick up on Emily's use of the term brave, which I think is a really important one. And to emphasize that, Yash, be brave. And, you know, when I think back about my time as an undergrad, it it was really, uh, it was great, but it was really hard. You know, I was the first person in my family to go to college. And so it was like this completely different experience, but now that I have all these years of, 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 you know, experience looking back, I can see that I was largely poised to learn what I thought other people wanted me to know, you know, the things that needed to be on the test, and, and we all have to do those things, right, you have to get your grade, you have to show that you can do micro 401 lab and, and get the right peroxidase result, you know, all those types of things, but the thing that I didn't do that I didn't feel like I had the confidence or even the permission to do was to ask the questions that I was interested in, you know, to push myself into that area and to give myself that permission to be curious and to follow those things. And and it happened eventually, you know, I went through undergrad, I I did uh, gap years as a technician and, and did some really great research that was fun, but it wasn't until grad school that I really started to understand what it meant to have that permission to be curious. And, and so having the bravery to, to say, yes, I'm gonna work on this because I'm fascinated by it and you don't need any other reason than that is something that, that you should do. I'd like to pick up on Willie's point. Um, a lot of what, there's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of data, but, but and, and uh, you can delve into any of those uh, stories and, and, and what other scientists have done and create great stories. But uh, uh, you, all, you also want to carve your own path and carving your own path will take time. So, so uh, uh, you need to, to uh, give yourself permission. Is, is this what I'm passionate about? If this is what I'm passionate about, then then uh, uh, do I am I in a circumstance where I can take that time and that energy to focus on that passion and 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 uh, do I want immediate results or do I want to whatever it is that you're passionate about be able to make a difference later on? So 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 uh, time is 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 a really important factor here, all within the the the, the situation of I have a family, I have two children, I have all the other things that are now being highlighted very much in the media about being being a parent and and, and doing that split. So so the other side of all of this is time management. You have you need the time, but you need to use it wisely. And and uh, I just took on a new technician and and you know it showed in my google calendar it's like oh my gosh explode and that's what i wish as a, as an undergraduate that that i knew to manage that time better and and some of that management is to give yourself as emily said the permission to do things that are not for learning. You think it's not for learning, but it very much is. So uh, uh, one of the things I I realized I did well was I chose to go to the University of Chicago in part because uh, 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 someone wisely told me that if you knew how to write, then you knew how to explain yourself and convey the information as a scientist you know my my uh, uh ability as a scientist i still work very very hard at it because my brain is always exploding with information and or as a scientist we're always thinking about the the what ifs and the and the outliers and whatnot and and to get all that information down in the context of a science manuscript it's actually all of my my language classes, my so my my uh, uh, reading Kant, reading uh, 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 oh my god, uh, uh, 
the cart, like all of that. What uh, like to it really is Shakespeare as a seventh grader reading that and writing that essay. You know all those things really as a scientist is more important than knowing how to uh, to pipette because you get those in in lab day to day, but knowing how to write is probably from from this uh, at an undergraduate le level time management and writing extends to everything. Thank you so much for your responses. Yeah, um, I, I just want to comment on something that um, it was just said, like I'm currently in second year in neuroscience, but I also have a minor in bioethics because I think like writing and language is so important to be able to express yourself. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you all for the wonderful advice. And thanks, thanks Yash. Uh, for participating. And I now ask Michael to come up. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I think my video is loading up. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I, I like the piece of advice that was given earlier. I think a lot of undergrads um, can kind of get a lot of value from that. I have a more technical oriented question, um, uh, specifically for Dr. Shi and Dr. Lynch. Um, I am I, reading up the biography. I saw that uh, both of you did uh, did work with hematopoietic stem, stem cells. And one thing I'm a bit interested in is, well, recently we're finding more and more about how developmental niches uh, of stem cells, especially, and the progenitor cells of, these immune, of different immune cells kind of affects the performance of these of cells, especially in disease contexts. And I'm very curious to learn, to get your perspective on, I guess, where do, where would you like to see more attention uh, divided in terms of uh, uncovering these developmental niches? Um, yeah, and, and just get, I want to get your overall thoughts on that and how that, how do you think this is gonna impact, like this kind of insight will impact the future of cell immunotherapy? You wanna go first, Stephanie? Right. Sure. Um, okay. So, so uh, uh, this is very, very active research. It's very, it's difficult in the context of, of, of actual human hematopoietic stem cells, although we, we are starting to try. So, so some of what uh, uh, um, in in the normal context, it's it's difficult to get. Uh, uh, as I said, age uh, uh, normal bone marrow cells from 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 human individuals, but but I have an ongoing study. It's now into its third year, where we were able to acquire uh, individuals um, uh, bone marrow CD thirty four positive cells, and we've done transplantations and whatnot. But that's all in the context of a mouse system, so we can only assay what uh, what those cells may be, maybe uh, uh, how their environment, the individual they uh, they uh, came from or uh, uh, how it impacts their, their uh, function in the context of those mice. And the mouse system is uh, exactly the same. We have taken them out of those individuals. So we don't, we don't have that niche component insofar as what is happening now. We can do some changes. So that's what uh, I've, I'm starting to put inflammatory cytokines like TNF or mimic infection and start asking those sorts of questions. But the cutting edge is really uh, in, in, in various mouse systems uh, where, where they're manipulating uh, uh, all the components. There's the, this amazing now uh, microscopy system where, where you can take a, a slice of, of, uh, of um, bone from a mouse that has been manipulated in many different ways, either putting uh, a, creating a, a situation where there is leukemia uh, or, or MDS or MPN type situation by, by uh, uh, putting mutations in or taking away a, a key oncogene or, or tumor suppressor. And then looking at all the different cells, you can, you can dot them with different colors and see what's happening and then and then uh, change that environment. So we can do some of that. And there are individuals, including at Princess Margaret, who are doing that with, with uh, in the context of blood, using, uh, using sections and doing things like intravital microscopy. But the technology, technology in the context of especially humans are, are what's limiting. But we really need to because we know that especially in the context of immunotherapy, the, the, uh, what is happening in the bone and also systemically, including uh, um, signals from our brains 
affects how 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 our our blood works and all the other systems work and how things like like immunotherapy or various other uh, treatments will, uh, will impact the patient. Well, maybe just to quickly put sort of a different spin on that, I. I remember when I would uh, teach classes, I would tell students early on that the most important word in stem cell biology was the F word. And I would ask someone to tell me what they thought the F word was. And somebody would usually say a different F word that wasn't the one I was thinking of, but it's function, right? The term stem cell is a functional definition. And so being a blood guy for a long time, I actually was one of those people who thought, okay, maybe it's overly reductionistic for us to call this one cell an hematopoietic stem cell because in vivo, it's actually kind of that cell sitting in a particular oxygen tension in a, at a particular distance from sort of perivascular niche, you know, with a, with a, a macrophage sitting next to it with a certain type of signaling milieu. And so I get really excited by work still in trying to understand hematopoiesis and tissue engineering and all of these other things, especially because there are new technologies like organoids that are available. Because now I think we actually have these platforms to sort of turn our reductionistic approach to teasing apart function as sort of a population-based phenomena. And we do that in the mice, right? It, it, everybody on the call knows about working with mice, but it's a, it's a little bit hard because it's difficult to visualize. And, you know, zebrafish make that uh, easier in some ways, but um, I, you know, just, just to sort of throw that almost a philosophical bent on what Stephanie said, I think that asking the same question, but in a completely different way or from a different perspective is gonna be important to help us understand the biology that, that we're fascinated by. Thank you for your comments on that. I think uh, if I could sum that up, it's how we can, how we can better profile this, this problem is, one by figuring out where we're lacking in niche in developmental niche engineering effectively uh, from what I've gotten and replicating the human niche um, instead of being purely reliant on the mouse niche or trying to replicate the human niche as best as possible, um, as well as trying to ask questions from a different perspective philosophically on how stem cells fundamentally operate. And in, this, in the case, I'm guessing I'm talking about uh, HSDs and ESCs probably. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, I, I guess I forgot to introduce myself real quick. I'm a uh, second year undergraduate life science student, immunology and genomics here at U of T. Um, so my my research right now is focused on uh, profiling the uh, the migration of, uh, pro profiling the single cell transcriptomics of cells that migrate from the uh, pyrus patches in the intestine up to the uh, cortex in the brain, specifically immune cells uh, in the context of stroke. Uh, so that's my little bit on me and thank you for, thank you for, your, uh, for your answers and for your time. All right. Thanks, Michael. Um, now I ask John to come. Hi. Um, so um, uh, thank you so much for the uh, fascinating talks. They were really felt so informative. And um, I was just wondering uh, two questions. Uh, what do you think is the future of stem cell research, like all the utopian applications and all? And um, how could an undergraduate student like me, I'm in uh, second year, get involved in stem cell research? Well, I'll start. I'll yeah. start. Yeah. Uh, um, so in the context of, of hematopoietic stem cells, uh, the possibilities can be endless. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> taking it to, so so let me take a step back so so uh uh Willie was saying that 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 he he was sort of right uh, um his research was at the fourth uh right at the cusp of when uh induced pluripotent stem, stem cells came in and you know the uh, the first sort of transition uh was was making them into blood stem cells the 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 the, the adult stem cells we know the most about are hematopoietic stem cells Ironically, Gordon Keller, who is one of the scions of, uh, of induction of an embryonic stem cell into, into pretty much any other kind of adult stem cell, whether it's heart, uh, liver, uh, whatnot. Well, he started with hematopoietic stem cells. And you know what? 
his group and his disciples and many other people around the world have been trying for decades. And, and that's the, the, that's the, the, the uh, embryonic uh, uh, to, to definitive hematopoiesis, what the adult hematopoietic stem cell is. They can make a mouse sort of in their defined media or other people with other sorts of things. So we have the promise, they can't make an embryonic stem cell become a true definitive adult hematopoietic stem cell with the ability to, to uh, engraft a mouse long-term. They've been trying for 30 years. Uh, uh, and so promise, we know so much and we know more every single, like uh, we're more and more studies. I started in mouse hematopoiesis and, and I studied uh, hematopoiesis stem cells. The number of papers mentioning what makes a blood stem cell, a blood stem cell keep increasing every year. So there's promise <laughs> and we get better at it, uh, but to really trans, uh, 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 differentiate even even an uh, embryonic stem cell to certain adult stem cells, we're not there yet. And that's 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 the that's the goal mine, really. That's what we need to do. And and uh, maybe it'll be in a year. Maybe it'll be ten. It could be another thirty years. So I was gonna say, in terms of. Uh, I guess neural stem cells, or I think it could be applied to, to any stem cell field. I think more and more this idea of understanding heterogeneity has become a really important topic. And that can be heterogeneity in stem cells and the environment that stem cells exist in across age, across sex, across species. We just don't know that much about how heterogeneous of a population they can be. And so I think you know, these emerging single cell technologies um, and, you know, I, are, are going to allow us to ask those questions and, and answer those questions. But I would say just heterogeneity in general, I think, is becoming more and more a buzzword that you hear, you hear all the time in the field. Um, and I think the other thing I would say in terms of how do you get involved or how do you best sort of get yourself integrated within a, a stem cell lab. I think my best advice is really, you know, do some reading and, and try to figure out what exactly you're interested in, in terms of like brain, spinal cord, hematopoietic system. So start there in terms of narrowing, narrowing it down. If you, if you, you know, think stem cells are something you want to study and then and then like we were talking about earlier, take the opportunity to really capitalize on meetings with people. Um, all of us love to talk about our research. Like most of us will talk about our research all day long, but I, I love when a student comes in and they're not just like, oh, I, I think stem cells are cool. Like someone who's read a little bit about the work that I'm doing and has some really cool questions, that's how you can set yourself apart. And I'll just quickly say, I sent John a chat with a longer answer for the sake of time, but I'll just say part of it. I think that the future of stem cell research is really very open and that it's always been more limited by good ideas and technologies than by the biological potential in the systems we study. That's why these sort of epochs come and go, great thinkers come along at the right time. And so to be curious, be brave, and um, you may well be one of them, John. So good luck to you and your work. If I can add just one more thing, cold call. Do what Emily said, read up, decide who you, uh, wh whose research you like, what area you like, email that person, be brave. They may respond. Thank you all so much for your and wonderful responses to all my questions. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lynch for uh, your message. I'll make sure to read it and save it. <laughs> Okay, we've got about eight more minutes, so we ask um, Yasin. Hi. 
Hey guys, thank you all for your amazing talks and uh, especially Dr. Lynch, your emphasis on bravery is uh, inspiring. So thank you. Um, I have kind of a, a theoretical question. It's so, so a big, a big challenge in uh, trying to understand how the brain works is that we, it's difficult to get a picture of how gene expression is changing in vivo in a human brain. So there's been a lot of great stuff recently about the brain on a chip idea and trying to model that uh, like outside uh, the brain. So I, I was thinking, has there, so I, I had this idea, which is, what if we took one of these microfluidic devices that have like a, a, a cell culture on it and just implanted it? And this is utopian kind of, <laughs> but, but implanted it into, a, into the mammal and have the, have the media just, be, just consist of filtered blood that ran through and and that would be kind of that theoretically that seems like it would solve the problem with the whole micro environment technicalities and all that kind of synchronize the cell culture with the brain you know kind of have the same csf so that it seems like too easy that <laughs> that this would work so i'm wondering what you guys think about like the technical challenges in pulling something like that off so any thoughts? Um, I can I can go first and just sort of maybe people can jump in sort of as they want to jump in. Um, but I think you know the so we we do a fair bit of work with a uh, with a lab the Wheeler Lab um, who work on microfluidics. Um, quite a bit. And one of my colleagues, one of my sort of the postdocs that started at the same time as me is pioneering the use of these microfluidics uh, chambers to look at the behavior of neural stem cells. And so again, I would say this is just something that's in its early stages. So for her, she's trying to make sure we can get these cells to, to live um, and, and to survive within these devices. And so that's just the state of where we're at right now. So I think we're sort of at this amazing spot where there's all these really innovative, cool technologies that are on the cusp of being really applicable and translatable, but there's so much legwork that goes in to getting them working. And I think that's probably like Stephanie would probably, I'm sure it's the same in the hematopoietic system. So, so uh, uh, with, with uh, blood, the, the, the uh, sort of flip side, so I'm going to ask about the niche. The flip side of that is, is uh, for all that we know about the hierarchy of the blood and it, it constantly gets rewritten, it's not that tree structure, it's more of a, of a continuum and whatnot. Our understanding of this niche and especially those mesenchymal stem cells, which really should be called mesenchymal stromal cells because we, it's a mishmash there and that's the problem. We don't know really what the niche is. Is it perivascular? Is it, is it uh, osteoblast? Is it the, because of the macrophages or the, the megakaryocytes that feed back on the hematopoietic stem cells? Is it what's circulating around from the brain or when we have an infection, even from our liver and whatnot that goes uh, to, to um, make these stem cells behave the way they do? Probably it's all of those. Yeah. So, so one way of trying to do and really make we make that is as you say, try to create something like that in micro. So, so uh, one uh, technique that has sort of worked is not a microfluid device. It's these ossicle systems we implant. You put in. You can take mesenchymal uh, stromal cells from from an individual, create a uh, 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 the, the 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 stroma put in, uh, uh, so for instance, one of the ways of trying to understand how a disease like leukemia may have completely rewired the microenvironment of, of, of uh, uh, a male patient um, is to take 
their stromal factor, grow them up in the dish, put them into these ossicles or microfluidic devices. Some people have done that. Implant normal uh, hematopoietic stem cells, either from a mobilized patient or whore blood or adult bone marrow, put them on, in the ossicle system, put them into a mouse and let them grow and see if, if uh, you can see changes. Problem is you can sort of get it work. You need to have really good hands, but it's slow and the technical difficulties are extremely high. But you know what? There are some people who can do it. Like 30 years ago, my mentor, no one believed him when they said, hey, you can take one, one hematopoietic stem cell or a, a cell from, from a leukemia patient and you put it into a mouse, you can graft and you can create that, that disease in normal environment, normal blood again, again, in some sort of way. I mean, in the car. So, so, so it, uh, uh, it'll be slow. <laughs> uh, we see some promise. Um, and, and, and it's, but it's, it, it's a matter of trying. We're trying uh, and we'll see. Maybe to pick up on that. I really like the way you're thinking, Yase. Thank you. No, you, you shouldn't allow what you want to achieve to be limited by what you can achieve. Right, that's how you make a difference. And I think that one of the holy grails of biology is to be able to instantaneously measure gene expression over time in living systems that continue to live, right? Instead of having to take sections or instead of doing electrophysiology until the cells peter out, but to have some- I would say not, not, uh, 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 in the context of a stem cell, gene expression gives you a snapshot, but really the changes are finer and supposed translational changes. It, it's the signaling events and whatnot and the metabolic changes it, that we uh, that really a lot of our and, and what's happening to, to, to the accessibility of, of the DNA back and forth. Those are those, those that's, and then that's what changes the transcription. That's my. <laughs> well, you can apply any type of, of, of filter you want, but you know, what I'm saying is to be able to interrogate the sort of biological quantum state of any cell or tissue without perturbing it. And to be able to do that over time and to really watch development, all of the ways that Stephanie mentioned as it's happening. So maybe you'll be the guy that figures that out. Uh, hopefully. I, it, it would be a great idea if I could get into the Wheeler lab. I've been uh, <laughs> looking at their website a lot. <laughs> They're doing some very cool stuff. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I hope I could get in. They they only want uh, uh, master's degrees, uh, so you know it'll probably take a while, but hopefully, fingers crossed. Anyways, thanks a lot. Brilliant answers, uh, and take it easy. Thank you. Thank you. And that's unfortunately all the time we have for questions today. Um, so yeah, just thank you to everyone uh, for participating and asking all these wonderful questions. I hope it was enjoyable for everyone in the audience. And again, thank you all to our uh, wonderful speakers for taking the time to answer all these questions. Um, and so now the uh, current session here in the research hall is over. So I ask everyone to converge in the bioethics hall for the debate. Thank you once again. <laughs>